morning. <laughs> Lou, Lou is now awake. Lou apparently can't tell the time between two minutes and one minute, but that's okay. We're all good, Lou. We're all good, Lou. Sorry, bear with me a second. And a very good morning to all of you. Standing by. I'm utterly terrified that on our way to Cheetah Plains, we. Uh, FM. Uh, so far, no tracks on this side. Sorry, everybody. Just chatting to Brent and discussing our plan for the morning and where we're going to go and look for the wonderful Queen of Juma, Karula. I'm utterly terrified I'm going to miss tracks, which is why we're going at a snail's pace, because it's still that half dark. The vehicle lights aren't that much of a help. I can't tell if I want them on or off. Probably off. What do you think, Dave? You reckon on? Maybe. They're not really making that much of a difference in my life. No. There we go. We'll see how we go. No missing tracks, Dave. Nope. I'm watching you. I'm watching you. If, if we miss tracks, I'm going to blame you. <laughs> Thank you, by the way, for those of you that sent through updates on the lions. We will discuss that later. But for now, I am on my way to, in theory, Cheetah Plains, unless... Oh. Careful, Dave. Friend of mine in the Sabi Sands ended up in hospital from driving over... Just from driving over a stick, like we do all the time. We smack ourselves in the head and the face all the time. And shame, the poor guy just got so unlucky and he got smacked in the face and ended up damaging his eye and in hospital with his eye cut open. Brent for Jamie. Lou is requesting that I urgently get hold of Brent on the Game Drive channel. Brent, Final Control is trying to get hold of you. I don't think they can get through. There we go. There you go, Lou. I have got a hold of Brent. He... I'm not quite sure what he's going to do. Probably return. Any leopards hiding in trees? I don't think so. Woof. Dave? Yeah. I do trust your weather predictions these days. <laughs> Aha! I see. Dave, I do trust your weather predictions. Is it going to rain upon us? Brent, uh, final control requests that you turn your phone on and take it off airplane mode. Might be one of the weirdest things I've ever said on Game Drive Channel. Not the weirdest, but one of. Right, sorry, so you think it's going to rain? No, I don't. You don't think it's going to rain? Well, that's, that is good news. Well, no, it's not good news. It's good news for us. It means we're not going to be damp. We've got the rain covers. We do have the rain covers. And we've got the massive rain cover. Exactly. We have the roof. But then we have to go all the way back for the roof, Dave. I will drive very fast. But perhaps Cheetah Plains... I'm not sure. I'm tossing it up. Yes, no. In devastating news, Lou tells me that Brent has no comms, which you may have gathered from the game drive communication. In that case, Dave and myself will be holding the show. Oof. Left, right, or straight, Dave? I say straight. You say straight. Yeah. Let's go straight. This program features live coverage of an African safari.
and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good morning and welcome on another magical safari live adventure. All kinds of exciting things await us on this dark and gloomy morning. This is a safari dive. Ready. Standing by. Good morning to all of you and welcome on what is in theory the sunrise safari. I don't necessarily think we're going to have a sunrise though. I think it's just going to gradually get lighter. But my name is Jamie and this morning I have Dave on camera with me and we are coming to you live from Juma Private Game Reserve in the Sabi Sand in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. And not only are we live, but, drum roll, we are also interactive, which means that you can send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. Uh, let's see what amazing conversations we can come up with this morning as we trundle. Long, long story for those of you who are new viewers and the use of the word trundle. I actually think it might be more of a bumble this morning. But yes, as we trundle along and look for whatever exciting things we can. Personally, I'm hoping for some elephants. I haven't seen elephants properly in a long time. You too, Dave. Yeah, I think we should, I think we should see some elephants. It's amazing how with the rain, they've all disappeared. It's like they've melted into the bush. Now, we are not alone this morning. Well, we are actually right now. In theory, we should not be alone this morning because Brent should be heading out in a little bit. Unfortunately, Brent is having, Brent and Jandre are having considerable radio problems, which means that they've had to return to the DRC. Not the DRC is in the Democratic Republic of Congo, fortunately for us, otherwise we might not see them before the end of drive. I do mean the Juma Research Camp, which is the name of the main camp where everybody lives. Hopefully Connor will manage to get that fixed. And you'll notice that as I'm trundling along, I'm checking very, very carefully outside of my right-hand side. And the reason that I'm doing that is because, of course, yesterday afternoon on the Sunset Safari, Brent had Kar Karula's two gorgeous little cubs, Shogilia and Hosanna. And <laughs> Brent had me in stitches last night because apparently he was sitting with Shungile for a long period of time with absolutely no idea and that of course is what leopard cubs do You've got no idea that they're there half the time that you're sitting with them But apparently he was sitting with Shungile and the next thing Hosanna crept up on Shungile his sister and jumped on top of her Apparently Brent said he levitated out of his seat He had absolutely no idea that there was a second leopard cub there and that combined with a little grrr noise that Hosanna made <laughs> made for quite the surprise but the reason that I am so intently focused on checking for tracks is first of all the light is terrible which means that a very very slow pace is called for in order to avoid missing any tracks and secondly Karuda was off hunting yesterday and in this kind of weather we can almost guarantee that she managed to catch something. And so far, Dave and myself have seen one herd of impala hiding behind the bushes. And mostly, the animals are trying to remain as hidden as possible in this cloudy, windy weather. Well, I have very good news for all of you. It seems as though Connor has managed to address the problem with Brent's radios, and he is up and running. So let's head across to him so that he can say good morning. Good morning. 
Welcome to a cold and blustery Sabi Sands private game reserve on this Monday morning. My name is Brent Smith. I have Jandre, aka The Virus, heading on camera with me today. Fortunately, there's some distance, so he's not going to spread his virus. And we are going in search of Queen Karula and the Cubs. Now, there's a possibility that Queen Karula did not make a kill last night. That means those Cubs are going to be in the, almost the same place we left them on yesterday's sunset safari. Of course, if she has made a kill, we're going to have to get on our tracking shoes and see if we can find them. And it is a very cold and blustery morning and fortunately for the safari, the rain is staying away and uh, we give it full permission to rain just between or after safari times. And now we are not the only people out and about. Aubrey is out. Morning Aubrey. Um, no updates yet. I'm going to go check the last position of Karula's Mon Pimp Pines and there was in Gaila audio from what sounded like in front of Vuyatela. Here we go. So for those of you wondering what I'm doing, is I'm talking on the game drive radio to all the other vehicles that traverse our area. And one second, copy, thanks very much. Uh, so what happens is finding animals is a, a bit of a team sport and we notify all the other vehicles and, and then we can work together to find the different animals to find you the best sightings. Remember this is 100% live, uh, we cannot plan what's going to happen next so remember that you can also ask us questions on the hashtag Safari Live or use the email address questions at wildearth.tv now, of course, we're in a wonderful part of Africa. Uh, we're in the Greater Kruger National Park, home to many lions, leopards, cheetahs, wild dogs, hyenas, elephants, buffaloes, giraffes, and a, a various host of other antelope species. For me, the most important of all being the bushbuck, which is my favorite antelope. So we're getting close to where the cubs were left last night. And uh, it's not unusual for a leopard to leave cubs alone for sometimes two or three days if she's been unsuccessful in her hunting for rays. But uh, I think with last night's dark and stormy and ominous weather, Queen Cruel is probably going to have been successful. So we're going to have to probably put on our tracking hat and tracking shoes and uh, see what we can find. What are you complaining about, White Crown Trikes? Is it just my passing? Or... Oh, we can hear them making a noise. I'm wondering whether they're alarming. And possibly, and oh, we can't even see them. They're deep in the thickets. Now, speaking about deep in the thickets, uh, let's go across to Steph, who's on foot, who can get deeper into a thicket than any of us can on a vehicle. Good morning and look at this blustery day that we've got here with us today. I am Steph and we've got VM on camera today and we are on the bushwalk for this morning's AM safari. Big wind like this means we're going to stay out of all the thickets and all the forests and <laughs> all, the, all the dangerous areas. Moving bush like this really obstructs your view to see any animals sitting behind any bushes or hiding behind any trees and of course the wind through these massive ears of mine sounds like something quite um, astonishing to be quite honest and so I can't hear anything either in these thick bush environments. So what we're going to do is we're going to sort of cross over this little valley in front of us. There's a nice big open patch of ground and a huge seep line and we're going to move with that seep line probably visiting Treehouse Dam and the area around where Karula's cubs were seen last night and where she has been wandering the last couple of days. And who knows what we're going to pick up. That's our plan for today. I don't quite know what we're going to find out there on a day like today. Usually when it's windy like this, a lot of animals move to the thicket areas, move to depressions where the wind sort of brushes over them. Right now we're standing on top of 
quarantine clearings and I must be honest with you it gathers quite a lot of this gusty breeze now what is it never ceases to amaze me to be quite honest with you is the size of the trees on top of quarantine clearing there's a couple of hills out here that have some decent trees on but nothing quite like the number of trees here on quarantine they are massive we've got a series of really big marula trees this is one there's one just behind it as well and these are real giants you get marula trees all over the place but to be quite honest with you very rarely do you see marula trees of this size and i'm hoping that the fruit bounty this year from these trees is going to be something spectacular of course marula trees they do fruit they produce a lovely yellow fruit probably around about that big anywhere between february and march and are collected with great enthusiasm by everything out here from people all the way through to birds and animals it is fantastic it's a bit chilly I must be honest with you it's not the warmest day that we've ever had out here but i'm sure after we get marching a little bit it will definitely heat up and be a bit more comfortable it's not uncomfortable it just is a bit more comfortable now i don't know what the wind chill is doing right now but it's around about 67 degrees fahrenheit about 19 degrees centigrade so it's by no means a freezing cold day although for us desert creatures out here anything below sort of 70 degrees fahrenheit 75 degrees fahrenheit is a cold day needing long pants and jackets <sighs> let's go and have a look at one of my favorite termite mounts and see if they've managed to open up their mound this particular termite mound we see quite often not only do we run past it when we're doing jogging during the middle of the day but we also like to come visit it it's nice and close it's obviously a nice place to watch the sun come up and quite often it always has a certain amount of activity going on it's this one that you see in front of us right here and its sphere of influence so its influence over the bush in actual fact starts from around about here so from about here where we're standing right now all the way to that termite mound and the same distance all the way around it is the sphere of influence for that termite mound this is the air conditioning system for the fungus garden that grows at the base of this termite mound and which the termites feed with a variety of different plant matter so they feed the fungus and in turn the fungus feeds them but to do that they need a very very specific set of conditions and these termite mounds create that condition they are basically just big air conditioning systems keeping a very constant uh, humidity and a very constant temperature as well quite high roughly about 32 degrees or 31 degrees centigrade oh no i see oh it is very warm though i love these things so all the heat that's generated in these termite mounds raises up over the central column and basically these pointy domes that you see over here are to create that it's to create a channel of hot air that moves up through the middle of these termite mounds and even if you put your hands here difficult for you to for you to visualize of course but it feels like a warm oven or a hot plate that's been left on a, a, a hot plate on a stove if you pass your hand over that hot plate you can feel a temperature difference and I can absolutely feel there's a temperature difference right here especially in this hollow on the other side of the wind it is very warm inside there Ooh, nice give my hands a bit warmer <laughs> all right Jamie's got some nyala for you we're gonna carry on through this bush and we'll catch up with you in a little bit well, I think that Steph might have the right idea climbing up onto a termite mound and enjoying the warmth in the meantime we've got some slightly puffed up nyala a combination of a herd of females and one lone bachelor that is keeping them company and what's interesting in terms of watching his behavior at the moment is that it seems as though he's interested in one of the females and I'm not saying that because he's following her around he's not that interested just yet so she's obviously not immediately an estrus but he has been showing all kinds of behavior that generally we associate with a territorial antelope which of course Nyala are not they don't have any kind of a strict territory 
But when a female, like this tan one, comes into estrus, then they do start displaying dominance behavior. And what he's been doing is rubbing his preorbital glands up against various trees. And just in general, his body language seems to be intent on establishing his dominance. Hey, mister. He's stopping for a quick grooming session, which when your coat is as shaggy as his, his is, is absolutely essential. You can see in the sniffing of her nose that she's still a little bit nervous in this weather. And I know that Steph has touched upon it, the fact that the wind is howling. And for an antelope, it's relatively risky to move into dense vegetation. But for those of them that are potentially going into labor, Mary, you wanted to know whether or not any of them have had any babies or whether we have any signs of impala young. And the answer is no. I haven't seen any baby impala yet. I promise you, if we see baby impala, we are going to stop. Dave, do you have a bet? As uh, I've already lost. You've already lost? Oh, Dave. Dave's done so well this year. He's already predicted when the rain was going to happen. I thought perhaps he might get the impala births oh, really? spot on as well. I've got two days until my date. I said the 15th. Um, based on emotional reasons more than anything else, sentimental reasons, because a friend of mine is due to have a baby on the 15th. So I've said that that's when we're going to see our first baby in parlor. Nyala, on the other hand, I know that Brent saw a gorgeous little baby not too long ago. It must have been about three or four days ago now. Though they, of course, don't have such a strict breeding pattern as the impala do. And just an interesting point to note, have a look at this female. And you'll see that she's also if she's also got mange. In the same way that the Styx cubs did. If you look, you can see the bald patches particularly around her neck. And that's something that we've seen more and more with the antelope of this area in this drought. And that's what it is. It is a product of the drought. And for the most part, these antelope will most will shake it off. And they'll be absolutely fine. But it is interesting to see how some of them are afflicted and some not. If she's feeling particularly itchy, the female behind her seems to be fine. Oh, she's disappeared. She's now just an ear. There we go. And the male, of course, is completely unaffected. And as we sit and listen and watch the scene in front of us, all I can hear off into the Mulwati. It's a little bit too far for you to be able to hear with this wind. But all I can hear is the black cuckoo. I'm so... Okay, I know I know it's meant to be glad to make things more or less depressing, but in theory the black, the black cuckoo is singing I'm so sad this morning. It's gone silent. She's having a really thorough groom of the bright white underneath her tail. The last few days, we've had the Nyala's cousin, the bushbuck. We've actually had four of them living in the garden where we live. And every time we walk out, you get that flash of the white tail as they sort of lift it in alarm and dash off away from us. And that is common to all of them. The Nyala, the bushbuck, and the kudu all part of the same family and all with that incredibly fluffy underside of their tails. A little bit more visible in the Nyala and the Bushbuck. It is a, a very, very interesting physiological adaption. When they're dashing through the vegetation, that white shows up crystally clear. Good morning to Charlie, who would like to know whether or not the antelope have a horizontal eye, much like your deer. I, I understand exactly what you're saying, much like horses as well, with their, with their pupil being horizontal. And I can't remember. I have been close up to antelope before, and I'm trying to think now. Yes, I think they do. They do. 
they do have a horizontal pupil. And Nyala especially do, because I have, Nyala's probably the antelope that I've been up the closest to. Now, of course, we always talk about the fact that you really shouldn't feed antelope and, or any wild animal. They are to be left purely to their own devices. But Nyala have a tendency to get very, very relaxed around people and around rest camps and camps in general everywhere. And I have to confess, I have fed Nyala before. I shouldn't have, but I have done it. A place called Sondela, close to Pretoria. And having been that close to them before, you can actually get a close view of their their eyeballs. And a very good morning to you, Michael. You want to know if Nyala females, talking about pregnancy a little bit earlier, you want to know if Nyala females can come into estrus any time of the year and why humans do not have a, a, the sort of a similar estrus cycle to most of the other animals out here. Um, first of all, Nyala absolutely can fall pregnant pretty much every time of the year. However, there will be a peak towards the rainy season because essentially for that, for these animals, it's the best possible time for them to have a little one. There's a lot more food available and therefore they can provide the nutri or gather the nutrients that they need for themselves and to be in order to provide milk for the little one. Human beings and our estrus cycles or essentially when we're able to reproduce, well, in a way, we are much like things like elephants and lions and primates. And even Ninyala, I suppose, in our own way, in that we don't have to have a strict breeding season. We don't have to have a strict Easter cycle. And that's something that has, over many, many thousands of years, evolved, simply because as social creatures, we have got to the point where we don't have to be reliant upon just the the resources at that exact time that we give birth so whether it is summer or winter and you'll probably find that if you go back far enough there was a time when human beings did have a peak breeding season or at least a peak survival season where babies were more likely to survive but in terms of what we need what we can do now and in terms of our evolutionary history our social background we don't need to have a strict season, just like lions don't really need to have a strict season. The difference is, of course, with lions is that they actually synchronize their Easter cycles or synchronize their heat cycles. But you might have found if you go far enough back in history, human beings might have done exactly the same thing. Have babies at the same time, and then you've got a good chance that the rest of the, the group that you're in will help to raise the child. Right, we're going to trundle along Ledwood since our Nyala have disappeared. And speaking of spring and breeding, it seems as though Steph has found the future generation of a feathered creature. Indeed we have, coming down this game path that you see us walking along. Right up here is the most beautifully constructed nest. And if you come and have a look inside, is an egg of the most beautiful coloration. Have a look inside there. That is its natural coloration. It's not dirty. That is what it is really looking like. Amazing, hey? And just have a look at that circular construction that's made of the roots of pulled up trees and it's bound to the branch by spider's web. Have a look over here. That is spider web that's been collected to glue the branch or to glue the nest to the egg. Isn't that amazing? Like how do birds know how to do this? I mean, of course, they are bred to do that, but oh, if evolution has bred them to do that. Let me just say that. I don't want to flick this egg out of here. There we go. But come and have a look at the side. Have a look at the construction here. So. These are bits and pieces of root from fallen down trees, the aerial roots. You then have, or not aerial roots, but the tiny little finger roots that come off the main ones. And then at this part of the branch here and here, spider web has been used to tie the, 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 the nest to the tree. Isn't that just amazing? Oh, careful, look over there. You can see the spider web there. As to 
As to what bird it is, I'm not sure. Both myself and Herbert think that it could be a drongo's nest, a forktail drongo's nest, with that coloration of the egg, the size of the egg, the height above the ground, the way that the nest is constructed, all those types of things have, will, will lead you to uh, an, an identification of this particular bird. But because I don't study nests and eggs in any particular detail, it's really difficult to see without the parent bird. So the only birds that I'm hearing around the, around the area at the moment are a black-headed oriole, um, which builds its nests in thickets. I'm hearing a white-headed or white-crowned shrike at the moment. It could be a white-crowned shrike, but I don't think so. But we both think that it's probably a drongo with that coloration, that lovely speckled coloration that's on that egg. And then the very finely constructed web, uh, or very co finely constructed nest made of webs as well. Anyway, the mystery remains, but we'll come back, we'll come visit this one and see what the baby bird looks like. All right, let's carry on going. We're still on our way through this thicket, along a game path. We're going through a thicket over here, out onto the sea line at the top, and then we're going to move in the open. We're going to move along that sea line, and hopefully down to eventually Treehouse Dam and the area around Treehouse Dam. I'm going to see what is happening with Karula. Now watch out for this VM. This is an angry little bush, as is this one right here. See these thorns coming through here. VM is very well, with much concentration, is looking through his viewfinder and doesn't always see the snags around. Ah, here we've got the first of the jewel beetles of the season. Have a look at this guy here. Now, in the sun, these beetles usually have a metallic sheen to them. This one, not too much. I see it's got a slight bronzy color. moving away from me. So that is a jewel beetle of some description. One of the firsts here. They get quite big. They can get about this big as well. And then they emerald green. Get them with a little range of different colors on. All right, moving through our VM. It looks like the elephant have blocked us successfully. So <laughs> it's going to take us a bit of time to get over this. But um, while we're doing that, I'm going to send you over to one of the others see what they've got. Hi guys, sorry, I'm just really listening very carefully. Copy, thanks very much Rex. Um, I might be interested a little bit later. Okay, so that was actually really important news, that's why I was listening to it. And uh, it is that the Rexon has found the missing Inkahuma cub uh, by itself and he said it's not looking very healthy so I think we're, we're, we're very lucky we've still got eight cubs and with the mortality rate being around 70 percent and as hard as it is to, to, to sort of accept is that we're lucky to have well, not lost, but possibly only lose one. So we're going to keep checking for Krula and her cubs. We've checked the last position where we left the cubs last night, and they're not here. Check towards Treehouse Dam, uh, and then we might go across to where Rexon is and, and have a look at that cub. So uh, from what I could hear, it sounds like it might have an injury. Now, an injury could be from other lions, um, from Birmingham's, from adults in Kahumas. Uh, it could be from a buffalo. It could be from anything really and if we manage to only lose one cub we've done very very well and we saw with the sticks how quickly the tide can turn and it can lose all the cubs so it is all the predators have a very high mortality rate uh, Karula is sort of an exception to the rule when it comes to to big cats she's an incredible mother and how she's managed to raise so many cubs to, to adulthood is, is, is absolutely amazing. But, oh well, as I say, you can't predict anything out here. That cub might just need a good meal and it'll be fine. But it is still by itself. 
and uh, the rest of the pride are not with it. There's that one lioness last night that went wandering, and I think she might have been looking for the missing cub. Okay, now back to focusing on looking for leopards. So we've, we've bashed around where Karula was last night, where the cubs were last night. No sign, we've had no tracks. As I said, those cubs, they might still be in this block. They, they can move four or 500 meters from where their mom leaves them while she's away. So they could still be around here. It might be worth checking a little later. Uh, atop, we've checked atop all the big termite mounds. No luck, except for this one under the jackalberry tree. This is the last of the spots. I mean, let me just go a bit further forward. There we go. There's a, a termite mound with a jackalberry on top of it. Let me look with my binoculars quickly. And there's no sign. So, with that windy, cold weather last night. I think Karuda's probably, probably been successful in making a kill. Now, finding where that is, that is a different story. So far, I've got no tracks on any of the roads, but Karuda doesn't like to walk along roads as much as other leopards. And uh, we're looking for three leopards and 2,500 acres and it's a bit of a needle in the haystack situation but don't worry we're on it okay now we're coming down towards the treehouse dam there are quite a lot of little bits of water around so they're not necessarily dictated for coming to a drink here. Oh, I did promise uh, a few safaris ago when someone asked about Treehouse Dam to show you the remnants of the treehouse and we can see them from here in that marula tree. There we go. You can see those pieces of wood that have obviously been nailed into the tree. That's all that's left of the treehouse at Treehouse Dam. Now, while we continue to scour this area with eagle eyes, uh, we're going to go back across to Jamie, see what she's been up to. Well, speaking of scouring an area with eagle eyes, Dave and myself have decided to brave the elements and make our way to Cheetah Plains. The reason I say brave the elements, of course, is because Cheetah Plains, one of the best part of Cheetah Plains, is the great open areas, which are going to be very, very windy. But that's okay. We're going to brave them and we're going to see what's out there. And the reason that we're heading in, across in that direction is, first of all, just because Cheetah Plains is amazing, but secondly, just to double check and see whether there's any sign of the amazing Tundi, who of course I have not seen since I've been back, and in fact I have not seen in a long time. Tundi is Karula's daughter, her oldest daughter, along with Shadow, part of the same litter, and she has at this now one remaining cub one of them was very sadly killed by the Styx pride of lionesses i'm hoping perhaps we'll have a chance to catch a glimpse of tundi's remaining cub and see whether or not it's a male or a female and maybe even just get to spend a little bit of time with it that's what i'm hoping for personally that or brand new Styx cubs would also be an absolute pleasure to see i don't think no, I don't think we've had them on camera just yet, so that would be something exciting to see. And we know for certain that of the predators of this area, one of them, or many of them, would have made a kill last night in this weather. It's almost a guarantee, so it's just a matter of tracking down and finding them. The last time I saw Tandy was this, in this exact spot. And in fact, I think it was this exact tree. Oh no, I might have passed it. Was it this tree? No, it was a little bit further back when she had three impala kills. One female leopard and three impala kills, just, just because. It just goes to show what an opportunist leopards truly are. And how even a leopard with a full belly, it's not a guarantee that they're not going to try and hunt once again. Oh. We're about to go into the Mulwanini, actually. I didn't realize how far along Gauri Main we'd come. 
We'll see how we go. The signal tends to disappear in what's known as Gremlin Hollow. One massive dip, and you can actually, if I stop for a second, you can see just how deep that dip is. And for us bringing you live safaris, that dip can signal the end of our broadcast as we go through it. But let's see how we go. Aha. Instead of seeing how we go, I think that's a far better idea that Lou has had. We're going to send you across to Steph and we're going to make our way through the deep, dark dip. You catch us here looking at a common spike thorn. Uh, Gymnosporia is the genus of this particular plant and you, they're fairly common out here but what is quite interesting on them is two things. One is that they tend to be infested with what I've identified as a milkweed leaf beetle. Since last year I've noticed that these little beetles that you see inside there, they're, they're these bronzy coloured round beetles are only sitting on the common spike thorns in these areas. And although they are, from what I can gather, they are sap feeding. In other words, they chew the bark and wait for the sap to come out and then they suck up the sap. Nothing really feeds on them. You don't find anything else on these trees. From time to time you do find these bizarre eggs. And in this particular tree that is no exception. The underside of these leaves have these funny perturbances on. Oops, just you getting stuck up on some some uh, some thorns there there you can see these eggs on the underside of these leaves as to what they are i'm not too sure i hardly ever pass one of these common spike thorns without looking to see when these eggs are going to hatch in the hope that i find whatever it is clustered on the branch could it be these beetles laying their eggs underneath these uh, underneath these leaves absolutely i mean you see them quite often oh, I've got spider webs all over my face and the wind is making them <laughs> tickle me you see these beetles all over the place and I'm you know there's a very good chance that it could be the the the, the, um, the spike thorn but because the spike thorn itself is very high in tannins not much not much eats it and so these trees have very few other insects on them and so laying your eggs on these leaves is also a very good way of keeping them relatively safe what do we use Gymnosporia for? The, the wind isn't uh, that much, um, excuse me, the wood isn't that useful to be quite honest with you. The wood is, is not very uh, hard in any particular way. It doesn't really turn. You can't really make firewood from it. It's quite spiny. But these leaves can be used uh, to get tannin. And tannin we use out here in the leaf form. So you take a bit of a leaf like this, you crush it up. You're supposed to chew it. It is horrendous. And once you've chewed it up like that, you can then use it in the pulse, a poultice on any cut. So if you've got any cuts or abrasions, so for instance, a cut like that, you'd be able to take a bit of leaf, mash it up, put it in the cut, and then bind up the uh, the wound and it helps to stop bleeding I've used it on numerous occasions over here to help superficial bleeding little cuts and abrasions and whatnot you can then stop the bleeding with these leaves that's what, that's what I use it for anyway. all right come let's carry on going we're now in the we're now in the open as you can see it's much more open although it's it's by the time summer comes to an end it will be fairly thick right now we can see a good hundred two hundred yards in front of us and it makes it a lot safer for us to navigate our way through the bush hopefully seeing whatever's in front of you before it sees you ah, yeah I wanted to show you where that nest Now, Janky, you've asked me, do, do beetles lay eggs and move on, or do they come back and care for them? Janky, they lay eggs and move on, as far as I remember. I don't think I've ever seen or remember hearing about any beetles that offer sort of any parental care of any sort. So I would say that absolutely, they lay their eggs and they move on. Um, remember that nest that we were having a look at just a little while ago? I said that the nest itself was made up of a collection of of roots and here you can see a broken down combretum 
one of the bush willows and as it's been as it was lifted these roots came into the air and it's these roots that were then broken off by the bird who wove that previous nest so it would have come and broken off a root like this and like this and like this and this and it would have woven these into a basket into that round basket that we saw and then stuck the basket to the sticks using fire or using excuse me fire what is my brain doing today using uh, using spiderweb those are the those are the roots that I was talking about interesting hey amazing that these animals can do to be honest now, I did see a spider here as well but it has since departed Alrighty, Mr. Vim, you're going to have to find your way across here without falling down. Now, Jason, you've asked me if I've ever accidentally walked into a community spider's web. Uh, let me think about that, Jason. Um, yes, you do walk into the strands, the outlying strands. I've never walked into those balls of nests. They're relatively, uh, you can see them a lot. But on years here, sometimes when the conditions are right, you get these infestations of spiders here. In particular, the golden orb web spiders. They build these massive constructions. Um, these orb webs uh, that are aligned um, in a, in a not, not, not horizontally, they're aligned vertically. And you can walk and drive through these things in the end of a walk in some summers here. You can be covered, absolutely covered in... Uh, in spider webs. I just want to show you this pic this flower here. I just find it absolutely beautiful. I don't know what it is. Yet, much like anything that we find out here, your knowledge varies seasonally. So while I have no doubt that within a few hours I'll know or remember what this flower is called, right now I can't remember it at all. But it's just got the most amazing have a look here. These are the male parts of the flower, the yellow parts. That is where the pollen is produced. You can see there, waving around in the wind. And then this is the female part of the plant. This without the yellow peas. And pollen from other plants will land right at the end. There's a little, there's, a, there's an opening there. Oops. There's an opening there right at the end of that almost snake tongue like tube. The pollen grain will move all the way down, all the way, all the way down, all the way down into the flower itself here at the base. And there will fertilize an ovum inside there. And from there the seed will be produced. Amazing, hey? Oh, it's got quite a lovely perfume. It's quite a, I don't know how to describe it. It's quite bitter. It's not a jasmine-y or, or lemony scent at all. But wow, that has got a strong smell for such a small little flower. Hmm. Interesting. Eh? Alrighty. On that note, we're going to send you over to Brent for an update. Now, as only Queen Karula and the cubs can do, they seem to have flown because I can't find a track anywhere, but hello. Dark morph Warburg's eagle. He looks about as happy as I am in the cold weather. All fluffed up. It always amazes me when you when you get a chance like this to look a little bit closely at these these birds. I mean, look at how vicious that hook on the beak is. And if we look at the talons, you can see they're wrapped how long they are. They're wrapped all the way around that little branch. And if you're an unexpected, unexpecting scrub hare or squirrel, I reckon that will be quite a traumatizing experience having those talons wrap around your little fluffy body and then be ripped apart by that curved rapier-like beak.
Now this is one of the three sets of Warburg's eagles that I know about on Juma that have nests. Of course we've got the pale, pale morph couple that live on Warburg's Road or quite close to the Juma Dam. And then we have the dark and pale morph that live next to twin dams. And in between them we have two dark morphs and this is one of the dark morphs. Now depending on the food availability of an area and, and things like that. Warburg's eagles can actually live in very dense proximity to each other. And uh, the average home range for a pair is around six hectares in, in ideal conditions, which, which this part of the world is. Although, judging by the balancing act and the wind that's blowing through, oh, itchy air, yeah? you can see those talons. Uh, I, um, Juma is what one would call almost idyllic conditions for Warburg's eagle in terms of nesting trees, food av availability. So we do, we, we are quite lucky with the mark we see. Okay, Mr. Warburg's, we've got other, we've got leopards to look for. So what we're doing at the moment is moving around an area where we think uh, Kula might have moved. We're looking for footprints to give us a, an indication. But while we keep checking, Steph has found possibly the most dangerous animal on foot. So our strategy about getting into the open worked because lying down about a hundred yards from us is what looks to be two buffalo bulls. They're lying down out of the wind behind a tree stump and from the looks of things, and I'm just going to be using my binoculars to see what I can see, is he's definitely got one sleeping with his head on the ground on the left. He's facing one way. And then his friend is with his head up on the right hand side. He's facing the other way so that they're protecting each other's flanks, basically. Now, what you don't want to do is stumble onto those two buffalo without some distance. You just notice that flurry of birds that just flew up there. That was some oxpeckers. They would be helping the buffalo to look for danger. They've got a very trilling alarm call and if those birds saw us they'd give that alarm call the buffalo would stand up and you know with buffalo they're quite unpredictable you don't quite know what they're going to do ever you don't really want to be standing without any large termite mounds or trees <laughs> especially this time of the year the buffalo still haven't picked up condition they're being harassed by lion they're skinny they're cantankerous they're walking far to water um, and so this time of the year walking around here is difficult because of these buffalo. Now, where we are now, we couldn't get much closer than we are. A, those buffalo bulls are lying down in what looks to be a thicket, so getting in there is going to be noisy and it's, you're going to have limited choices. We've got those ox peckers around there and then the biggest thing is the fact that the wind is not in our favor. So I carry around a little ash bag. Some of you may see it from time to time and I'll show you what I mean by wind direction. So if you have a look, the wind is gusting now from the left to the right but angling sort of up the slope which is dangerous for us we wouldn't be able to get into a position where we could safely view these buffalo bulls from where we are now so for now what we're going to do is cut under the wind in other words carrying our scent far away from these buffalo and just create some distance and move off so good we don't have to bump into buffalo they're unaware of our presence completely and we're going to keep it that way and leave them alone to the rest of their day and morning yes right. so crystal mars looking at those buffalo you've just uh, asked me have i been threatened by any animal before while on these walks Crystal, yes, absolutely. Um, 
there's from time to time that you do bump into animals like buffalo or elephant and lion, hippopotamus, rhinoceros. You bump into these animals in the bush in circumstances that are not in your favor. And by, I mean, by what I mean there is the fact that potentially you're wandering through the bush and there's an animal lying under, sleeping on the one side of a termite mound. You come around the termite, you give them a fright. <clears throat> and what you do is you force that animal to make an instantaneous decision. Uh, a fright or flight reflex and in cases out here most of the time it's a fright and the two parties just create distance with one another so you get a big fright lion jumps up or elephant trumpets at you or shakes his head and the first thing that you want to do is just create distance but sometimes the instinct to fight is overpowering for instance if there was a lioness with some cubs a lion on a kill or an elephant with a baby calf any of those circumstances, moms generally don't want to run away leaving their babies. And so they choose to fight. And in those particular circumstances, uh, it can get very dangerous very quickly. Most of the time, you just have to stand there and just talk calmly and when you can create distance. Um, but in some instances, you have to react suddenly and aggressively to try and change that that fighting reflex that you have with these animals and by I mean aggressively I mean clapping your hands shaking bushes running at that animal it's it's incredibly scary at the time um, exhilarating if you come out of it but quite scary and nerve-wracking um, and so yes from time to time you do have that uh, just recently probably about two weeks ago we had an encounter with a herd of elephant um, that's the most recent encounter we were walking down a drainage line on a walk and um, and encountered a herd of elephant that were moving slowly towards us and as it became clear what they were doing where they were going the lead elephant the lead cow became aware of our presence and we had to create distance while she was looking at us um, not a dangerous encounter by any means, but definitely exhilarating. We needed to create distance, otherwise she was going to force us out of that area. There were some tiny babies, little calves just this big. So that was the most recent uh, or recent memory that I have of a dangerous encounter. And uh, yeah, I mean, pretty much we all came out of it unscathed, which is what we try and do. So Jessica, all the way from Oregon, um, you wanted to know what the average safe distance is from a buffalo. Um, I don't think there really is a safe distance from a buffalo, Jennifer. Um, I think it's all it's, it's circumstance and environmental conditions that will dictate what that is. So sometimes you can get quite close to buffalo when the wind is in your favor, when you've got some cover, when you've got a good escape route. Um, when there's some height around you, for instance, a termite mound or a, a tall fallen down tree that you can climb up. But in other instances, it's much further away. In this particular instance of those two buffalo bull lying there, 100 yards for me was, was, where, I was where I was comfortable with. I wouldn't have become uh, comfortable any closer than that, mainly because the wind had, there's such a chance of the wind blowing onto those buffalo from us, uh, carrying our scent and then that massive amount of ox peckers that were there um, would have created a very difficult situation uh, with, uh, with no choices there really. Here we've got some termite mounds, for instance that there, <clears throat> and while not much, while not much of a barrier um, that you could use, you could always use it as some, as, as, as some concealment and then as some height if you needed to, but yeah. All right, we're going to send you over to Jamie. She's got some impala she wants to show you. Definitely less threatening than most of the big game on foot. An impala is not a risk in any way, shape or form to a human being. However, they are beautiful antelope and really nice to stop and look at, especially now. Of course, we've spoken earlier about the bet and the fact that any moment now the Impala babies are going to be born. And just have a look at this female. She is rotund for an Impala, to say the least. And usually a slender, graceful antelope. She seems to be balancing on legs that are far too thin to support that weight. She is so incredibly round. And if we look really closely, we might even see the movement of the baby. Look closely. 
You never know. I've seen it before. I've seen ripples across their bellies. Platus is kicking. That is one very imminent birth. It is a true marvel of biology that these antelope, or all animals, but these antelope are able to support themselves on those legs, run, escape from predators, run away from males, all whilst, car all whilst carrying a baby inside them. It's absolutely phenomenal. And something that I learned while I was, well, when I started working for Safari Live, is that with their sharp little hooves, and those of you who are horsey people, who have spent a lot of time with horses in stables, you'll know that you'll know this. But the little fetuses, their hooves are covered in what's known as a deciduous hoof capsule, which is basically a very, very soft covering, soft sort of mushy covering. Oh, shame. I'm so nervous. To help protect the female's insides whilst the foal or the ewe or the lamb is developing. <laughs> the speed of her tongue and all of the antelope at the moment are incredibly nervous you can see it in their reactions it's so windy they've got no sense of smell their hearing is completely compromised and at the same time they've still got to drop their heads and feed constantly looking up and this is a proper gaggle of pregnant females Still no babies, Dave. Nope. nope. When did you bet, as a matter of interest? The 8th. A little bit early. Little bit early. I've still got two days. And the Woodlands Kingfisher, what was your bet? To be honest, I can't remember. Can't remember. <laughs> well, mine's long past the Woodlands Kingfisher return. I said the 2nd of November, so I'm done. Dave, you were the 5th of November, apparently. Wow. Luckily, Final Control keeps a far better record than our memories do. All right, let's leave this herd of Impala and go and see what other treats Cheetah Plains has in store for us. Hopefully a cease in this wind. Intent, intent on blowing us all the way back to Juma. Two young males. I had no idea they were there. <laughs> Beautiful. Two little boys, not quite at their full, fully grown stage, but still lovely to look at. Whilst Dave and myself are going to continue on our search and scouring of Cheetah Plains to see what we can see, let's head across to Brent and find out what his plans are for the morning. So my eyes are still stuck to the ground looking for tracks of Queen Karula and her progeny. So far, no luck. But you never know what's going to happen. I think we're going to give uh, Queen Karula another few minutes and then I think we're going to go look for some lions. Now they were calling all over the place and uh, I think they're going to be a little bit easier to find than Queen Karula. Not so vocal, the leopards, in comparison to our wonderful lions. And just on the southern boundary now, I'm just trying to check to make sure that Karula didn't take the cubs and head back to the south out of our traverse area. I'm very hopeful so far that I haven't got any tracks, but you never know. But for every track that leaves, there's a track that must enter. Now, while we're looking for leopards, we've got some leopard questions. And this one's from Jordan. And Jordan would li like to know, is it true that leopards hunt from trees? Well, Jordan, it is true, but it's very unusual. Uh, most of the time they'll hunt from the ground and, and that incredible footage we do get to see sometimes from all over Africa of a leopard leaping out of a tree. 
onto something underneath it is very unusual behavior and uh, normally they'll hunt from the ground so it is true but I would probably say in all hunts that I have witnessed and I've witnessed a lot of attempted and successful leopard hunts in my days in the African bush I've only ever seen it once so I would say maybe one in 500 times do they leap from trees oh hang on listening to the radio apparently there's wild dogs somewhere at the side I'm just trying to hear where they're going uh, station with the Nkonzo for the are they heading north towards Gary Man at all Okay, copy, thanks very much. Copy, thanks very much. Okay, so there are wild dog tracks. No wild dogs. So, I'm gonna get Jean Red to show you quickly. Now, if we look to the east, and you see a little bit to the right from there, Jandre, so the top of that crest, and the top of that hill in the distance there, that's where the wild dog tracks are. There's no tracks heading north, but Jandre, make good use of that super zoom. Spot a wild dog for me on the road. How many millimeters is the super zoom there, Jean Andre? A thousand three hundred. A thousand three hundred, you say? Yeah. Isn't that incredible? That's a thousand three hundred millimeters. And uh, there are some trees. There's a road. But no wild dogs just yet. So we're going to change our direction. Uh, and of course, me being me, if there's even. <laughs> half a sniff at a wild dog, I'm going to go for it. So I'm gonna make my way towards that crest. And while I do that, Steph has uh, got something a lot smaller and a lot slower moving than a wild dog to show you. I certainly do. And on this stick that you see here, there is a insect living, a predatory insect, that's trying its very best at hiding away from us by looking like a nodule on this tree. What you're looking at there is a praying mantis, believe it or not. And it's obviously hunting these dead sticks in this area and has adapted a hunting method for doing that. So the head of the praying mantis is there. That's where its eyes are. And then its body is all the way down here, has this funny bump, and then has this very centipede-like tail, which I'm almost certain it uses as part of its hunting strategy. And then you can see its hunting legs curled up underneath its thorax there, held tightly close to its side, very muscular forearms that it uses to shoot out and capture unsuspecting prey. I'm certain that this particular praying mantis preys on something that would use sticks for something, either to gain height to jump off and to fly with, or to land on for whatever reason. There you go. Just that slight bump has allowed you to see exactly now that it's a praying mantis. You can see those folded forms underneath the head there, and those absolutely fantastic eyes. Praying mantis have some of the most beautiful eyes. Very large eyes, they use obviously to sight their prey with, in this particular instance, are just as camouflaged as the rest of this animal. Isn't that just amazing? I'll let you give you an idea of how camouflaged this 
insect really is. When we stand up and you'll have a look at where it is sitting, there's pretty much nothing around here except for that stick. It's just that one single stick and when we walked up to it, we spied a tiny little bit of movement and on that stick was this praying mantis. Isn't it incredible? He's now moved off onto the other side. There he is there. Amazing, huh? Yeah, always something new around every corner here. Casper, <laughs> you want to know if I'm wearing any special guide socks to keep insects from crawling up my legs? Casper, no. <laughs> These are just uh, a type of gaiter, I suppose. They just protect um, my shoes from getting filled with sand and grass seeds. Now, not really grass seeds, but it's really just to stop, um, to stop uh, stuff entering my shoes and to scratch my ankles while we're walking through here. Yeah? <laughs> Not special grass socks, socks at all. I don't think you need any special socks. You do get these clothes that are impregnated with uh, insect repellents, but to be honest with you, I haven't seen the insects in Africa really pay much mind to insect repellent impregnated clothes at all. They seem to just sort of ignore it wholesale. Um, yeah, I do use a, an insect repellent in summertime. I will use an insect repellent on my legs um, and it's mainly just for the ticks. Um, once the grass gets a bit longer and once summer really gets into full sway here, uh, the tick load increases dramatically and uh, to walk around here in summer with, you know, scratching at tick bites is just for me one of the most irritating things. And so I do put an insect repellent on my ankles and on my feet just to stop the ticks from crawling into my shoes and eating my feet off basically. Um, but yeah, you can't really do much about insects out here unfortunately. It's just one of those things in summer. Now Robin, Robin B, you've asked, is a praying mantis the only insect that has a head large enough or that can rotate its head to look over its shoulder? That's an interesting question. Um, I would say yes. I would say, it, and it, it praying, so firstly a praying mantis can really and absolutely look over its shoulder. It has a, it, its head can't really tilt so much as it can just turn its head and because of this massive eye, it can see all the way down its body. So absolutely, it can look over its shoulder, so to say. Um, are there any other insects that have that sort of articulation of their heads? Not that I can think of right now. There's a lot of insects with eyes big enough to see both below them, above them, and in a sphere around them all the way to the back of their bodies. There's quite a few insects that have large enough eyes to do that. But large eyes combined with a very mobile head not that I can think of right now. I think praying mantis probably is the only one there. So good, good, good nice comment there, nice question. All right, while well, I scan the horizon from the top of this particular termite mine and see if we can see anything of note um, while we're walking through here, we're going to send you through to Jamie. I'm doing something similar to Steph, which is just stopping and listening to the sounds of the bush on this cool and windy morning, and also just stopping to have a look at what is a very interesting sight. And we've spoken about this before, I'm sure, on one of our many safaris to cheetah plains. But this, of course, is a rhino carcass. Now, the nice thing about this particular rhino carcass, thank goodness, is that it was a natural death, apparently. It was not caused by poaching. It was just one of those things that happens in nature. And having a look at the skull, this was a relatively young rhino, just looking at the size of it. So I'm not quite sure what happened. It might well have been a fight with another rhino. And it's nice to be able to stop and talk about these things because of course, due to one of the tragic things that's happening in this country and throughout Africa, we actually can't show rhino at all. But just to be able to stop and look at at least the remains of them gives us the opportunity to really examine the in depth what is truly an incredible species. I'm just going to stop and jump out and have a look at this entire carcass and just give you a, a perspective as to the size, the massive, massive size of this animal. This is the skull 
or what was the skull, and the bottom part of the jaw is completely missing. But it is truly a massive animal, and this was, as I said, a young one, so this is a relatively small skull. Unbelievably heavy, very, very solid animal, and a bit smelly, actually. Ugh. And this carcass has been here for the last year and a half, but still, there's a little bit of meat still left on the bones. And this is actually, it's the wrong way around. Let me do this. This is the back part of the rhino's head. The nasal cavities, the orbital cavity is all around here. And then the nose. And the horn of the rhino would have grown up from here. And of course, the horn is just like our fingernails, essentially. It's a combination of keratin. So it grows constantly. It's not like with the other, with antelope, that it is essentially a bony structure. A horn of a rhino is basically a fingernail. It's just pure keratin that grows up from this plate. It's basically like the cuticle of a, of a fingernail. Absolutely amazing. And to give you an idea of the vast size of these creatures, one vertebra. And there's quite a few, there's different parts of the animal here. And as I said, it's a small rhino. But just have a look at the size of this vertebra. Absolutely massive. Far bigger than we could, than we begin to comprehend in terms of our own bone structures. All of the attachment points, Anatomically, those, these creatures are absolutely incredible. All of the attachment points for the muscles, the ribs. Beautiful thing. I'm gonna return that to where it was. And if we have a look, and we don't often get to, oh, here we go. I actually have never stopped at this rhino carcass properly and I've always wanted to. There's even a full section of spinal column. Look at that. Mm. It's even still, still attached to each other. The vertebra are all still attached to each other. And mobile, and a little, also, again, a little bit smelly. Let's just pop that back. You saw that vertebra there. Have a look at this. Still vertebra. And this is sort of towards the, towards, closest towards the sort of the upper middle back and the shoulder blades. Look how long this attachment point is. Running all the way along upwards towards the spinal column or along the spinal column. These are truly, absolutely massive animals. And the only thing that of course would have bones of a similar size or two things that would have bones of a similar size would be a small elephant or a hippopotamus. Absolutely awesome. One of the things that you notice, and I've been looking around this particular area to try and see if there's any evidence of it. In my experience with large carcasses like those, you can see there's a little bit of skin remaining over there as well. Like leather. But in my experience with large carcasses like this, when you, when you encounter them a year or so down the line, it's a strange thing. Nothing grows around them. And it's not so evident here because I think the drought has affected it. But if there was, if there were, if it was a normal rainy season, if there was plenty of grass around, you'd actually see a dead patch where the animal had died. And that's a combination of just the normal sort of bacteria of the whole rotting process and the whole breaking down of the body as well as a, as well as the action of vultures and the fact that they've defecated around that area and that in turn essentially compromises the vegetation and when I've seen it's it's a weird thing when I've encountered rhino carcasses before or gone back to places where rhino have died it's a completely open dead patch And a very warm welcome to Roger, who'd like to know, ouch, <laughs> who'd like to know why we can't show Rhino. It's a, Roger, it's a really difficult thing because we've got to find the balance between, which is why I'm, 
I really enjoy talking about rhino and raising awareness as to what amazing creatures they truly are. The stance of Wild Earth as a whole is that we do not want to show rhino partly as a statement against rhino poaching and also just in case it would make the lives of poachers easier, essentially letting them know where the rhino are. And it's a difficult one because there are such amazing animals and the wonderful thing about Safari Live in general is that we have this incredible reach and we can speak to people across the globe. So to be able to show rhino and to be able to introduce people to what an incredible animal they are would be a special thing, but unfortunately it's just not something we do. And sometimes it, it happens by mistake, doesn't it, Dave? Yeah. They, for, for, for such a large animal, they can be quite good at sneaking up on you. And every now and again you'll see us veering off frantically, or in the case once I think I told Dave to, we were talking about something and there was a rhino right in the middle of the road and I came up out of a dip. And we were live and there was nothing we could do. And so we went, well, I said, vultures. <laughs> uh, there are no vultures, but there were, maybe. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's amazing how on the spur of the moment, oh, speaking of spur of the moment, there's a bird of prey there. Um, you sort of frantically search for the ability to try and cover up for the fact that a rhino has just essentially photobombed you and come out of nowhere. And sometimes we have sightings, whether it's lions or leopards or any of the other animals that happens to include a rhino and we just have to somehow, the cameramen are very good at it, somehow try and avoid showing them. They're very special creatures and I, d I wish more than anything we could show them that it wasn't a situation that we can't. And Hunter, you wanted to know how many rhino are left in Kruger. I don't know. I honestly have no idea. And I'm actually not entirely sure that anybody really truly knows. I don't think anybody even truly knows the impact of poaching that has happened. I will say that the Sabi Sand has an incredible record in terms of keeping their rhino safe, which is a very, very special thing and it's a very difficult thing to do. Particularly, the Kruger National Park is particularly hard hit because they've got boundaries. Of course, the Kruger National Park bound uh, or the boundaries of it sit on Mozambican border and the Zimbabwe border. And particularly where Mozambique is concerned, it's such a complicated thing, rhino poaching, because it's so easy. Disney and everything have taught us to vilify the bad guy. And, and yes, rhino poaching is a vile, vile act. But it's desperate, desperate people who are seeking out a way of making money to support their families. And I know that it's, it's very difficult for us to understand because we've never been in that situation. We've never had to do that. We've never had to try and support a family in those sort of conditions. I don't know, I don't know how many rhino are left. And I'm not entirely sure that there's a very cynical part of me that wouldn't even trust the figures, the official figures that were given. Okay, these are definitely not going, these Impala are definitely not going to have any babies with them, given that they're all boys. But I am stopping at each and every single Impala herd just to double check. Now, of course, we do see rhino. Um, we don't show them, but we do see them, and we do get an idea of how they're doing. And James, you want to know how they seem to be handling the drought. Relatively well. They're weathering it relatively well, especially because black rhino are one thing. They're a species that generally cope r relatively well with arid conditions, and they are browsers. So much like elephants, they can, they can actually feed off the trees, which in turn have more nutrients because of their roots. But white rhinoceros are grazers, and we've seen what kind of an impact that's had, the drought has had on things like buffalo, for example. There are some thinnish looking rhino, but for the most part, they've weathered it relatively well. There's one very old bull, and I won't tell you exactly where it is, obviously, but there is one very old bull that we see every now and again that is looking particularly thin, but that might also be as a, a, a consequence of just his age. He's getting older, he's not quite resilient in the same way that perhaps a younger animal may be. The one thing I will tell you, without giving a location, without, without giving any specifics, 
there's been a wonderful, wonderful population boon. That is, that's really all I can say about the matter, but it has made me very, very happy wherever I happen to have been driving, and I've been, I have been traveling around the country recently. There is a wonderful population boon. And slowly but surely, we are overcoming the problem. I hope we're overcoming the problem. Once upon a time, South Africa was the center of rhino conservation, and we helped to, I say we, we like I was a massive part of this, it was before my time, but we as a country helped to bring back rhinos from the brink of extinction. And we're talking about 50 to 60 remaining individuals in the 60s and those sort of years, those decades. 60 odd remaining white rhino in South Africa and the population recovered. So if we can do it then, we can most definitely, that there's still hope for the species, absolutely there is. And I, I'm very passionate about rhino. Rhino, I've spent most of my guiding career, I've spent a lot of time focused on, on rhino in different reserves. Lots and lots of time tracking them, once or twice being utterly terrified by them. White rhino, of course, have this reputation as being one of the best animals to, to walk up to because they're quite slow and they're quite, they can't see very well and as long as you stay downwind of them, they're absolutely fine. Except, <laughs> unless you make a major mistake, in which case they are, unlike an elephant or a lion, they don't stop their charge, they just kind of come barreling like a tank. And black rhino, completely unpredictable, they're utterly nuts which is wonderful. It's my favorite thing about them. Another impala herd. It's become almost automatic now to stop and scan. No babies? Any babies? No babies. All right, well, we're just going to have to keep looking for the next generation of impala. And while we continue our search for the next generation of Impala, and I have to say, that seems to be all that's on Cheetah Plains this morning. <laughs> Only Impala. But while we continue our search for the next generation, let's head across to Brent and find out how he's doing. Alas, the wild dogs went south. But that could mean they will be north on the sunset safari. So we're right on the eastern edge of Juma and uh, we are heading back towards the, the northwest, seeing if we can find those incredible Inkahumas. So far, no sign of Queen Karula and the cubs, no tracks anywhere, and uh, I haven't been the only one scouring. So, well, Karula's done one of those magic flights. She's the only flying leopard in the world. Right, we're gonna go look for the lions. Hopefully we have a bit more success with the lions and keep our cat streak intact. Now, let me know how many days the cat streak is on now. I think it's 66 or 67. I might be a little bit wrong. Uh, so if you know how many days we've had cats every drive, uh, send the answers to hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv. But as you can see, it's quite a gray, dreary morning but the cloud is sitting quite high. According to the National Weather Service, we are supposed to be in for a deluge in the next two or three days. So we'll see what happens. Okay, I've spotted a birdie bird. I'm gonna show you now, I'm just trying to get into an easy, ah, oh, you evil birdie bird. There, it landed. Let's slow down, it's around there. There it is. Now, not a birdie bird we see too often. Oh, oh, wait, it's chasing another birdie bird. Oh, it's chasing a golden breasted bunting. But that is a ground scraper thrush. They're around, but we don't often get to see them too clearly. There we go. And you can see that very heavily streaked breast. Oh, they're gonna go chase the, the bunting again. Now, this bird will forever remind me of two people. One is, of course, uh, Brian Joubert, and the other is Andrew Francis. 
Now, when they were filming meerkats for Wild Earth in the Kalahari, there was one of these birds around, and uh, they decided, I'm not sure quite how, that the markings on the chest look like a, a Friesland cow, so a black and white a cow. I, I personally don't see it, but uh, every time you have Brian on the vehicle or we had Andrew on the vehicle, they would go, cowbird, cowbird, cowbird. Uh, I, I disagree. It doesn't look anything like a cow. The markings look nothing like a cow, but uh, I will never <laughs> forget because of those uh, two humans, uh, the ground scraper thrush. I, I can't really bring myself to call it a cowbird. What do you think, John? Does it look like a cow markings to you? Absolutely, oh, Jean-Dre agrees with them. Obviously, there's something that the cameraman put in their water. But we're not going to go into that. But there we go, groundscaper thrush. It might be a nice new one for your bird discs, and especially on a day like today when it's actually really tough to do birding, uh, to see a nice bird like that running along the ground. So they are mostly on the ground. They feed and forage and move along the ground. You saw how adept it was at jogging on. And uh, they do nest in trees, however, and roost in trees. But generally, when you see them, they are on the ground. Now, can you believe, I don't think we've even seen an impala, apart from when we drove across quarantine early this morning. And uh, this cold, windy weather is putting a lot of the herbivores into sort of safety mode. So, laying low but hopefully that'll bring us luck with the carnivores. Now, if we have a look to the left here, we can see there's lots of these little green bushes. Now, those of you who've been watching for a while will remember a couple of years, or a couple of wet seasons ago, this area was impenetrable. I mean, this it was a, probably my height, so a good six foot f three, six foot four high and thick, thick, thick round leaf teak. Now, round leaf teak never really gets very big is because the elephants love it so much, they keep it short. But with the drought, they've loved it so much that it's become sparse little bushes. And I'm just gonna jump out of the car, and see if I can find something to show you. Now, oh, it's on both sides. Oh no, I nearly lost my blankie. Oh, come back, come back blankie, there we go. So, you see, I mean, they look like the tiniest little, little trees, these things. Now, I'm just gonna try have a, a closer look. So, they look like tiny little bushes, but often, if you start looking closer inside, and that one's under the ground, let me find one that's out of the ground. Out of the ground. These, here we go. If you actually have a close look, so we've got this tiny little bush here, but can you see there, Jean? Just, can you see this? Yeah. So have a look. There's actually a massive stump. So I mean that stump is this big, but there's these tiny little bushes coming out of it. And that's, the elephants actually almost farm round leaf teak. There's a few species that do it with. Another one is of course the red thorns. So, I mean, oh, we can't really see this, but here we go, there's one a bit closer. Nope. See the Can you see the stump? So, I mean, again, a massive stump and a tiny bush. And the more the elephants feed on it, actually the faster it grows. So I think it's gonna be very interesting to come back to this area, especially as the rains continue, and before the beginning of the next dry season, see how thick these round leaf tickets, thickets, not tickets, they're definitely not tickets, they're thickets, have become. Now also, um, before we leave, the reason it's called round leafed teak, I mean that's, not really round, but it's round-ish. In the bush, that's quite round. Of course, uh, we don't have, what are they called, compasses to draw perfectly round things. So uh, that's quite round. The older the leaves, there we go, that's that's better. That's, that's more round, that one. That one's more heart-shaped. But, so, uh, as a, with a lot of scientific names, uh, sometimes they can be descriptive, sometimes they can just be 
plain cryptic, but with, in terms of the round leaf teak, it's a pterocarpus. Well, it's actually pterocarpus, but it's spelled P-T, pterocarpus, rotundifolia. So rotund, round, folia, leaves. Oh, okay, let's carry on. It's very nippy this morning. Well, hello, Bill. I'm only joking, William. Uh, well, William would like to know, is the rain we've had so far this year about on par with average rainfall for the year? Uh, it is very much so. We, we, we've already, I'd say in total, probably had 60 or 70 mils, uh, which is actually probably a little bit above average for this time of the year. Uh, we're in November now and we did start getting rain in October and normally you only really get your first proper rains in November So I'd say we're probably a little bit above average for the year so far uh, Of course, it's very difficult to predict whether we're going to get above or, or, or below average rainfall So the average rainfall for this part of the world is about 350 mils a year and uh, last year over the wet season we only got 120, so about a just le less than a th third of what we normally get. So fingers crossed. Uh, we want we want a normal rainfall year this year. We don't want uh, an excessive rainfall. So uh, quite often a lot of people don't realise that, uh, and especially we don't want sort of flood rains where it pours down 100 millimeters at a time what happens then especially after a big drought like we've had is that all the topsoil just gets washed away and that's just as bad as a drought in terms of uh, a lot of the grass growing so we want nice normal rains we don't want excessive rains and uh, hopefully all the water holes will fill and uh, well, speaking of water holes I think we're gonna go have a, a quiz at the Buffalo's Hook waterhole as uh, we make our way back towards the uh, west. Now one of the interesting things is that and I kept mentioning it because we've been so lucky and inundated with elephants and zebras and things like that recently and uh, now we don't see one and this rain has caused a lot of the animals to spread but it sounds like JB has managed to find one of those far-flung animals down in the east on cheetah plains. Well, I, I have indeed managed to find a hippo on cheetah plains and I would have been a fool to have missed it. And in fact, I was just thinking about it, this is the first time I have ever seen a hippo in che on cheetah plains at all. And we're currently at three in a row, Pan, and just bear with me, sorry, I've just heard an update. And I just want to have a chat on the game drive comms. Oh, hold on. I have to wait my turn now. I missed my opportunity. There's something on Cheetah Plains. Sorry, everybody. Ah. <laughs> Look at the bristles around his snout. Absolutely fascinating the way that their whiskers work just like any other animal incredibly bristly and I have had the opportunity to touch a, a, the area around the hippo's mouth before um, during a, a routine medical treatment with one of the hippos that we had on a reserve unbelievably bristly show hey boy uh, morning stations, my comms are about two out of five. I was just wondering what that update was around Cheetah Plains Pan. Uh, copy that, thank you. Could I take a standby for that? I'm at three in a row pan now. Copy that, thanks very much. Sorry everybody, this hippo is lovely, but we have somewhere to go. We have somewhere to rush to. Oh, how exciting!
hurting. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Sorry, Mr. Hippo. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. Shame the poor hippo at the moment. A hippopotamus, when it's in proper water, when it's in a river, when it's in a proper depth, when it's in a sort of proper deep river, is the most wonderful thing. You can walk right up to the side of the river, you can get within a couple of meters of it, and they are so incredibly relaxed. But unfortunately, they just don't have that availability at the moment. They don't have that sense of surety. And we've noticed a lot with the hippopotamus that they are not themselves. They're a little bit grumpy, a little bit short-tempered, and it's always important to give them as much space as we possibly can whenever we're passing by a body of water like that because they just don't feel safe at all. Sorry, everybody, we got a rush. Oh, I'm excited, I'm excited, I'm excited. We don't have that far to go. We've just got to cover this patch of ground past the cheetah planes antenna that we put up or the repeater that we put up not too long ago oh i'm so excited dave yes. remember the conversation that we had where i said we're not going to see this particular animal because they were going in the opposite direction three days ago i was wrong dave so i am so glad too What wonderful, wonderful news. Such a perfect day as well. I think some of you will have guessed, but still. They are unfortunately moving north, hence the reason for the rush. They're moving on a cold, cloudy day like today. All of our predators are moving which means we've got to race across before they decide to pop onto and quarrel, which of course we can't follow them onto. Sorry, Dave. Whee! There was a minor loss of control there, Dave. I don't know if you noticed. <laughs> it's okay, we just keep the foot on the accelerator. It'll be fine. That's what I've learned with dirt roads. Oh, there's even water here. That's a surprise. Sorry, can't stop to look. So Cheetah Plains has obviously had quite a bit of rain. I know that Brent was talking about the amount of rain we've had. Aaron in New Zealand. Of course, Aaron. You want to know if perhaps we could try and find the jackal pair. I know, Aaron, that you absolutely love jackal, as do I, and I'm always on the lookout for them, so yes, we will try and find the jackal pair. It's amazing the difference in working in different areas and at different times and the, the, the rise and fall of populations. I have worked in reserves where you hear jackal all of the time and it's the most amazing magical haunting call and yet it's something that we hardly ever hear in this in the northern sabi sand i'm looking forward because of course populations oh my goodness my word <laughs> and Vicky, you say, ooh, could it be cheetah, cheetah, cheetah? Maybe. I don't know where to go. Sorry, hold on one moment. Andrew for Jamie. Sorry, Andrew, what's your exact position? Copy that. Thanks very much, Andrew. Well done, Dave. You're a star. They're moving south. No, no, no. <laughs> they can't go north and they can't go south, otherwise we lose them. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I'm going to blow away. My microphone's going to blow away. Imagine if we had the roof on, Dave. 
could view them from the air. You want to know on the subject of our roof how quickly it can be put on or taken off. Not very quickly <laughs> was our experience. Oh, I'm so excited. Yay! I can see the vehicles. Um, James, it's surprisingly heavy. In theory, we could do it two of us at a time. Uh, Dave and myself could probably get it on and off, but <laughs> the other day when we had to try and take it off, we <laughs> it took five of us. <laughs> Admittedly, I think that's just because we need to get used to the whole process, but um, it, it's bolted in, so you've got to, hence the presence of my 17 spanner. Which way are we going, Darby? Oh, I'm so excited. Oh, there they are. <laughs> Um, it's not a quick process, James, but in theory we should be able to just offload, dump it if we need to. If, for example, we're doing a ma mad wild dog chase off-road and it's not raining too much. Oh, yes. Oh, I'm so excited. Oh, what an absolute pleasure. I'm so glad I've been proved wrong. That's actually a really, really, very cool image. There we go. My goodness me, boys. Have you eaten something recently or is it just me? <laughs> Look at the bellies on these cheetah. Ah, oh, what an amazing sight. Well, what, what's happening there, mister? find yourself a nice comfortable position standing on the trees so for those of you that perhaps are joining us for the first time this is an incredibly exciting sight a pair of male cheetah <laughs> probably in terms of the animals that we see that these are pretty much the only cheetah that we've actually had the opportunity apart from the skittish male that sometimes comes through to Juma these two males are the cheetah stars of our live safaris. I've never seen them this fat though. And they're moving about marking their territory. This is the route that they always follow. They seem to be heading towards Mala Mala, which is why it was so important that we raced in the way that we did. <laughs> For a creature that is usually incredibly sleek and slender, it's wonderful to see them looking so fat and well-fed. There's no other word for it. They are positively fat. Come on, climb the tree. That's a sight that we don't often get to see, but I have seen in, in the past is a cheetah climbing a tree. They're not quite as good as leopards. And in fact, they're probably slightly worse than lions in terms of their tree climbing ability, but they can do it. I don't think I've ever seen such a fat cheetah in my life. Really, genuinely. I don't know what they have eaten, but <laughs> they are very clear, clearly well fed. That's amazing. Just goes to show what an impressive physique these animals have. That they are able to gorge themselves to this extent and still remain as athletic as they are. Oh, I love cheetah. We hardly ever get to see them, so this is so exciting. 
One of the things I'm really keen to show you all, and I don't know whether it's ever happened on a live drive, it probably has, given the, the history of these live safaris, but one of the things I would love to show you. Thank you so much, Andrew. You're Thank you. Hi, guys. I'll tell you what I want to show you in a moment. Morning, how are you? Good, thanks. Awesome. Yes, a little chilly. <laughs> I would love to be able to show you or for you to be able to hear the sound that cheetah make when they're calling each other. It sounds like a bird that they chirp. Look at this. Properly, oh wow, properly marking their territory. And male cheetah are so particular. They walk an almost precise route. They have particular trees, like kind of like leopards and lions, but even more specific precise trees that they stop and mark their territory at. That cheetah is just a belly with legs. Wow. How lucky are we? And Stephanie, you say that you haven't seen a cheetah jackal oryx. Is that? Yeah, cheetah jackal or oryx yet on the drive. Well, I'm very happy to show you cheetah. They are such extraordinary creatures. Sorry, it's time for us to move, actually. Let's go and catch up with them before they disappear across the Mala Mala boundary. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be able to show you cheetah. You could also see jackal. I'm afraid to say, though, that oryx is probably not going to happen unfortunately that's there are far more arid dwelling antelope they are one of my favorite just by the way uh, we call them gemsbok g-e-m-s-b-o-k gemsbok that hard g in afrikaans and they are they are absolutely one of my top five antelope to see they're beautiful they're strong they're powerful and brave, such brave. I know that sounds, uh, that maybe sounds a little bit too anthropomorphic, but I personally think they are unbelievably brave in terms of the way that they interact with the world around them. Now, yes, Chem's book would be an absolute pleasure, but unfortunately not going to happen. But Cheetah and Jackal, on the other hand, we can absolutely provide and are doing so. Hello, boys. in perfect sync. Our Cheetah Coalition is a very, very special thing. Now looking at these bellies, it's hard to imagine that the cheetah want to eat anything further anytime soon. But Sarah, you want to know how long it'll take to digest this meal and how long it will sustain them. A big meal like this will probably sustain them for a considerable period of time, if necessary. However, because of their incredibly rapid metabolism, it's one of the things that allows them that those vast bursts of speed, albeit for a very short distance, they're probably going to be back to their sleek, normal selves in 30 or so hours that will be digested It'll have moved through their digestive tract. And you'll find that with all predators. They gorge themselves, they look incredibly fat and comfortable, but it only lasts about two days, sometimes less. And in the case of a cheetah with its rapid metabolism, even less than two days. So if we were, which is unlikely, but if we did have the ability to see them on a more regular basis, you would see that by tomorrow morning, they'd start to look slick, sleek again. And by... A day and a half, it would be gone, and they'd be on the lookout for food once again. And even with these full bellies, they'd still potentially hunt. Oh, this is wonderful. They're moving west as opposed to south. And Vernie
Penny, thank you so much for sending through your question, and I'm so glad we could share your first cheetah sighting on Safari Live with you. Oh, flop. Yes, I'd also flop down if I was that full. <laughs> Penny, you wanted to know, because cheetah have had such a hard time as a species, let's just go a bit closer. Oh, no, hold on. Just wait for it to stop rolling. Yeah, now we'll go closer. Vernie, you want to know if their numbers are recovering at all in, t in the Kruger National Park. We, the Kruger National Park has the greatest meta population of cheetah anywhere in Africa. So we really, we have a healthy number of cheetah. Their numbers remain pretty much the same though. And it's one of those interesting things, it's something that biologists and evolutionary biologists and scientists, conservationists have argued at length about. And the, the question is, how much of a cheetah's decline is actually just a natural part of their evolution? They have become hyper-specialized as a species. Oh, look at that. How amazing. <laughs> Spot puddle. So as a species, cheetah have become hyper-specialized and they just aren't all that resilient. In terms of genetic variability, they have got very, very little difference in terms of their genetics between individuals. And that is probably as a result of a population bottleneck. So something happened that wiped out most of the cheetahs in the world many, many thousands of years ago, and they just haven't quite recovered. And without genetic variability, they've got no resilience as a species. And of course, it's a difficult one because as human beings, we have had a tremendous impact on all species in terms of habitat loss, pollution, and all sorts of other impacts that we as a, as a species have. But at the same time, cheetah just aren't very successful. And the question is, is their extinction a natural part of evolution, or their gradual extinction, or have we been responsible as human beings? And it's a, it's, it's a line that's very difficult to draw. The population in the Kruger National Park is fine. It's healthy. And looking at these cheetah and looking at these beautiful cats, Anywhere in the world, or anywhere in Africa, that you have an overpopulation of lions, cheetah disappear. I'm just going to take, sorry, I'm, uh, it's going to rock the, the vehicle a little bit. I'm going to take my foot off the brake. <laughs> there we go. I'm frozen in joy with my foot flat on the brake. But anywhere you've got an overpopulation of lions, as I said, cheetah disappear. And that is one of the reasons why, and it's a, it's a big conversation topic and it's a difficult conversation topic, that's one of the reasons why in this area we have not, the Sabi sand have not intervened where the sticks cubs, for example, have had mange. And it's because it's all part of a natural population control, a natural cycle of things. It's hard for us to watch, but in a way it will indirectly benefit creatures like these. It's a difficult one but it is all part of nature's way. And cheetah have such a hard time of things. Oh, speaking of lions, this is the only other example with our big cats that you will see of a social, a permanent social grouping. Jessica, you want to know if it's common to see male cheetah without a female. And yes, that, that is how cheetah works. So females are solitary, and they actually aren't even territorial. They just have massive undefended home ranges, huge, huge areas. Oh my goodness. We're going to blow away, sorry. Um, so Jessica, yes, the, the females are solitary and only ever come together with the males to mate. Males, on the other hand, form these coalitions, and unlike lions, that is, it is very, very strict in terms of the coalitions that they form. They will only form a coalition with their brothers, sometimes on very rare occasions with cousins, but that is exceptional. It's usually brothers, and the reason behind that is, unlike a male, uh, a male lion coalition, where all of the members will at some point have a chance to mate and propagate their own genes, in cheetahs, they have a very, very strict hierarchy. 
Now, one of the things, we haven't really had the option or had the chance to really observe the behavior of these cheetah to get an idea of which one is more dominant. But you'll always find that there is a more dominant brother and only they have a chance to mate. And that's why they're so strict about the coalitions that they form because if only one of you gets a chance to mate, it makes sense that you only want the success of your brother because then he's propagating 50% of your genetic material. And you get cheetah coalitions, they can number up to seven, even eight at a time, although that is relatively unusual. It's more common to see about two of them together, or maybe three, usually two. And we live and we dream in hope at Safari Live that one day we will see a female cheetah, because I haven't yet in the northern Zabi sand. They're here, we just haven't seen them. And there we go. Hello, Fuzzman Sparkles. It's good to have you back once again. Fuzzman Sparkles, you wanted to know how big a male coalition can get. As I said, in exceptional circumstances, up to about eight. But that's relatively unusual. You're usually looking at about two, but any number between two and eight can occur in the wild. Oh, absolutely magic. Now, I need to do some chattering on the Game Drive channel, so while I do that, we'll send you back across to Steph for an update on his side. We've decided to get out of the wind and to build ourselves a little bit of a camp, and although we don't have much for the makings of a coffee or anything like that, we definitely can get out of the wind and we can make a fire. So what we've done is we've just set up our rain tarp, which is something that will keep us dry if we were caught out here in a sick shape over here. Just a basic A-frame with the one side a little bit higher than the other and then pegged out. I'm now in the process. I've managed to light myself a piece of dry elephant dung. Now the outside of this elephant dung is wet. So the outside we can't light, but the inside we definitely can, as you can see over there. And once I have my coal going, I will begin to try and find some leaves to try and put in there. All right. So that won't go out. I have some spare over here in case we need some. So now what we need to do is start collecting kindling. Now kindling is basically bits and pieces of dried woody material that you can use to put onto the coal that you've now made inside your elephant dung. It's a good idea to keep it sheltered as much as what you can. If you can light another one, here we go. So now that'll just keep it going, slowly smoldering, not too fast. If you put it in the wind, it'll burn out too quickly and you'd have to light another one. And on a day like today where it's been raining for the last couple of days on and off and the sun hasn't really come out, it makes it a bit difficult. And let me tell you something, when you're out here in the bush, there's nothing better than a fire to lift your spirits. So what I'm going to do now is I'm preparing a bunch of sticks that we're going to use to start our fire. So me and my brain, I always like these sticks to be in an ordered pile. And what you do is you'd gradually make the sticks a little bit thicker as you go on using drier and drier material. Or as drier material is what you can find really. Get them down. What we're going to try and do is go up in radius. So that you don't have to keep on adding fuel. Alrighty. You don't want it too close to your rain shelter. You don't want flames too close to your rain shelter at least anyway. So it's always a good idea to build your fire a little bit away from the from the build your fire a little bit away from where you're going to be sleeping if you end up sleeping out here and to either heat up stones if you can or scrape coals 
under the sand uh, when you want to sleep at night. So what you can do is you can scrape a little trench and you can put some coal inside there when it's burning, you scrape it in with a stick, cover it with a bit of sand and that will give you a warm bed to sleep on as well. It doesn't get too hot, depends on how deep you bury the sand. I found if I bury hot rocks about this deep below the sand, you can almost always just lie straight on it and it's very, very warm. But absolutely, alrighty, so now I need to go and have a look for some leaves. If these are going to burn, and I have to find some grass or some leaves. There's no grass at the moment. The termites, what the emeralds haven't eaten, the termites have eaten. So it looks like we're going to have to do this with sticks, which is going to prove a mighty task. Ah, <laughs> and ask and you shall receive. Some grass gets thrown in from the side. <laughs> Siberia, Zumi, you've said that maybe I should roast an insect over the fire and have some breakfast. That's actually a good idea. We've got a termite mound in the background over here. And the soldier termites make an absolutely fantastic, fantastic meal. All right, so here we go. Let's try and get this piece of grass alight. And then on top of that, we are going to try and add some sticks. So let's do that. Let's get our pile of sticks ready. I'm doing is melting my eyeball. There we go. Come on, take, 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 please. Got a lung full of elephant dung smoke there. <laughs> We're getting there, don't worry. Try and try as you might. You will succeed eventually. We're getting there, don't worry. I see more grass is arriving by the second. Amber? You've just asked me if I'm serious about cooking and eating a bug. Absolutely. I'm not going to do it right now, I don't think, unless we, I'm seriously hungry. What I'm thinking about doing is just boiling some water and having a warm cup of something to drink on this blustery day. That's mainly what I feel like doing. But you can absolutely eat insects. What you need to do is stay away from insects that are red or yellow or black or have any markings of red, yellow or black on. But generally, most insects here you can eat with, no, with little to no problem. Come on. There we go. Almost set myself a light there. All right. We've got some flames going here. Now for slightly thicker wood. There we go, come on, little flames. Getting there. 
We've got a permanent flame. Yes, we've got one. <laughs> Finally. Yes, you, Liz, you've asked, if there's no elephant or rhino dung around, could you use horse dung uh, or any dung as, as, a, um, as a substitute? You absolutely could. You don't necessarily need elephant dung. I only use elephant dung because inside it stays relatively dry um, and outside as well. There's a lot of wood in it and so when it burns, it really does burn quite well. We have flames. Took us a bit of time and a lot of oxygen, <laughs> but we got flames. Now we just need to get some larger stumps burnt as well. Burning. And now basically a fire just becomes a, an exercise in adding gradually larger and larger pieces of wood until you have a proper fire going, which I'm hoping to get done now. Alright, so what we're going to do, we're going to go and look for some more wood to put in our fire and then we're going to heat up some water and sit here and enjoy some flames for a bit and enjoy a nice cup of water. And in the meantime, we're going to send you over to Brent who's got something to show you. Well, I'm quite jealous of that fire and I think Jandre is as well. Um, it is a quite nippy this morning, but Indeed, we do have something to show. More than one thing, in fact. There we go. Hello, in Kahumas. When, I know there was a single cub missing. It was spotted this morning. And I wonder if it's made its way back to the rest of the pride. It was seen not too far from here. At the moment I can only see one, two, three, four, five cubs and one lioness. That's not to say the rest aren't about here somewhere. Ooh, it's the first time I've seen a a slightly hungry looking Inkawuma. They've been so full and saturated after over the last while. Now Morning Glory was wondering how far that lost cub was seen from the pride. Uh, probably no more than about 500 meters from here. They're all looking back quite intently. Interesting. Hello, little one. And as you can see, the rains came in the nick of the time, nick of time for the Inkahuma cubs, and uh, they're mange seems to ha have abated. Now, mange is one of those things that comes up, up about in times of drought. I'm going to join the female by the looks of things. Not lying in the, the nicest spot, it's quite thick on the edge of a little river system. Now apparently one of the Birminghams, I'm not sure which one yet, and one of the females moved north from here. So we'll have a quick look what's happening here, then I think those two might be mating, so we might go look for them shortly. There we go, cubs all over the place. And I can see five cubs at the moment. There we go, one, two, three. And is that another lioness at the back there? It... <laughs> uh, a, a foxy lady would like to know if that uh, other cub can be picked up in a blanket and driven to the rest of the pride. Um, I'm sure it can. Whether it's a good idea is, is, is in question. Uh, even in a blanket, that little lion cub at this edge would, uh, how, to, how, 
how, how to say this, would make you look like you'd been in a violent stabbing. Uh, the, the, those claws and teeth would absolutely destroy a blanket and absolutely destroy anyone who tried to put it in a blanket. Firstly, it'd be very difficult to catch. Even a, an injured or unwell cub would be very, very feisty. Now, as much as humans want to interfere, it's a bad idea uh, and you must really if you really love wild animals you let them be wild and you don't interfere and uh, cub mortality and cub death is is part of nature it's natural and on average about 70 percent of all little cubs that are born to the big cats will perish. Now, if they had a 100% success rate in raising their young, there'd be no impala, wildebeest, zebra, or buffalo left. And uh, there's a reason that these animals have high mortality rates, and, and nature is in balance. And as much as we want to be gardeners in Eden, this is Eden, and it doesn't need us to garden it. It gardens itself. Yeah, they're all lying up in a relatively thick area. So quickly across to Jamie, uh, who is with the other cat of the morning, and they're unfortunately heading south. And indeed, as Brent said, unfortunately, our cheetah are very much on their way into Malamala. They are standing on the boundary as we speak. But we have been incredibly fortunate to spend as much time as we have. Luckily for us, um, unlike most of the other safari vehicles, is of course, we have the camera with the incredible capacity to zoom in. Hey, Dave, that we don't have to disappear anywhere. We can stick with them. They just stopped for a moment to spend a little bit of time resting on the road and who can blame them with those enormous bellies i wouldn't be planning on moving anywhere anytime soon and there we go cheetah watering the plains of cheetah plains marking their territory and as i said they have regular marking spots watch this now the other male's going to do it or not come on boy setting a bad example but actually, that does give us an interesting insight into the behavior of cheetah males as they mark territories, because they take turns to mark the separate boundaries and the, the sort of the separate objects. So one of them will go and mark one tree, the other one will go and mark the next tree, and so on. Which makes total sense, because of course, saving up your stock of urine, with the two of you sort of spreading it out, you'll go twice as far. What a beautiful view. I'm still absolutely flabbergasted by those bellies. I really genuinely, I'm, I'm not joking, I have never seen such a fat cheetah in my life. They are so well fed, which of course is wonderful. James, I didn't realize that. I actually hadn't properly looked at the, into their eyes. And James apparently has noticed that one of these cheetah brothers has what looks to be a cataract. And he wanted to know whether or not that is related to age or if it is related to an injury. Just bear with me one moment. We're going to just catch up with them. Well, no, we're not. We're going to go and watch them as they walk further south along the boundary. Um, James, I honestly don't know. And it actually it would be relatively impossible to tell in terms of what has actually happened to them. I've been looking at their canines because earlier on I was asked a question as to how old these cheetah might be. And of course, we, we don't know for certain. I haven't had a chance to get to know them properly. But I've been trying to look at their canines and they don't seem to be that old in terms of the wear and tear on their teeth. Perhaps I need to have another look, but it could be injury related. But I've seen, I have seen young predators, young cats. I'm thinking particularly about a lion that I was once involved in the capture of. Capture for a good reason, not a bad reason. Capture to move it to a separate population so that it could breed with them. Um, who had a cataract at three years old. So I honestly don't know the answer to that, James. And I hadn't realized one of them had a cataract. But that is a very, very distinctive feature. Sad 
to see them go, but happy that we got to see them. And I was actually going to talk about it. Was, it was my, the next sentence on my lips with in terms of the cataract and identifying individual cheetah, Laura and Bob, you wanted to know, since we use spot patterns to identify leopards, how do we go about identifying cheetah? And the answer is you can use their whisker spots. Um, that it, much like in lions and in leopards, it is unique to each and every cheetah, although the top, the top row of spot patterns isn't necessarily as clear. However, one of the ways that I do it is actually essentially exactly the same way as I, I personally identify individual leopards. And that is the fact that their spot patterns are like fingerprints. They are completely unique to each and every individual. And you can look at them exactly the same. So whether it's the spot patterns on the bottoms, as is the view that they are currently presenting us with, or their sides or their shoulders, you just look for some of the dominant big spots and you slowly but surely, it's not as easy as leopards, I have to say. Again, that's because of the lack of genetic diversity in a cheetah population. So it's not as easy as leopards, but you can learn to identify individual cheetah by their spot patterns. Like hyena as well. Very, very similar way of doing things. You just have to look really closely, and it usually involves the use of pictures. Which is something I used to do where I used to work, because we only had... We had six cheetah that we saw regularly, Babalo and Lesedi, two males, and then Songo and Sanana, also two males, and then two females, Naledi and Kusala. And we, we learned eventually to identify each and every single individual cheetah. Don't go, come back. They are such beautiful cats. I mentioned earlier that it is fantastic to see them with such round bellies, and we've spoken at length about the fact that a cheetah as a species is a relatively unsuccessful one. And Sean, you wanted to know what their success rate in terms of hunting is compared to lions. And the answer to that is that their success rate is less than that of a lion. It's area dependent, of course, and it's prey density dependent. It's, it, it, there's a lot of factors that will determine an, a predator's success rate. But for the most part, a cheetah, it's... Oh, that's an inconvenient place for you to lie down. Oh, luckily this one's continuing. You're probably looking at around less than 20% of hunts initiated actually result in kills. Which is really tough. Especially for the female cheetah with their cubs. There's so much out here that is a threat to them. And in terms of the predator hierarchy, cheetahs sit right at the bottom. They really are, as a species, not particularly resilient. Just a, just a couple of things to remark upon before our cheetah disappear. First of all, look at the color of their eyes and how dark they are. And then also look at the tear tracks that run along in the inside of each eye. And that, of course, is a product of the fact that they are diurnal hunters rather than nocturnal ones. So much like sports stars sort of paint the dark paint along their cheeks to reduce the glare, that's exactly why a cheetah have those markings. Hi, Jamie. Sorry, I'm not just saying hello to myself, by the way. There is actually another guide called Jamie. I haven't completely lost my marbles. Sandy, you wanted to know, you were wondering about how cheetah paws compare to a leopard or a hyena. And Sandy, what I'd like to do, oh, how convenient. Thank you very much, mister. What I'd like to do is actually draw them for you because it's, it's probably the best way, unless we can find their tracks, but unfortunately the soil is so wet that or it's sort of hard and they're not going to have left tracks. 
To give you a rough idea, um, you can see the claws. In that way, they are similar to hyenas. They, of course, do not have retractable claws like lions or leopards. So the claws are visible in the track. It sort of looks like a hyena track, but it's like a, it, it, it's, it's sort of halfway between a hyena track and a leopard track. They're more elongated than the leopard tracks, and they have the three lobes, but the three lobes at the back of the pad are quite sharp, very sharp, in fact, and quite angular. And then, as I said, they have the claws, and they have the, the way of walking like leopards or lions, where their back foot falls very close to their front foot on each side. The other thing is, in, it, which is completely unique to the cheetah, and I think the wildebeest is the other exception to this. Remember how we've always spoken about how with different animals, the front foot, the front track is always bigger than the back track. It's more, it's rounder, it bears most of the weight. In cheetah, it's the complete opposite. And in fact, their back track is larger than their front track. And that's purely for traction. Their back feet are larger so that they can take off in the way that they do. It's, a, it's an adaption for speed. <clears throat> okay, I do need to do some chattering on the Game Drive channel again, just in order to get some vehicles here before these cheetah disappear. So while we do that, let's head across to Brent, who has got a lion on the move. We have got the authority Mfumo on the move. Now, he started jogging. We're not sure what he's moving after, but I am riveted to find out could it be a lady friend could there be another male lion and uh, he is heading into some thicker area but we will stick with him now he's got quite the rotund belly in comparison to the lioness and cubs oh dear is that a roadblock ahead of us Andre? yes that is quite unfortunate now if you're a male lion you just go under it if you're a Land Rover, what do we do? We just go through it. He's having a sniff or a smell or a listen. Okay. I'm gonna try see if we can navigate around it rather than through it. I think we're gonna be able to go around it. Just. There we go. What? Oh, there we go. Are we going to make it? Are we going to make it? We're not going to touch the tree like the elephants have after a mud bath. There we go. See that? Nice mud from an elephant having a scratch. Now I have lost sight of the authority. Two, oh, there he is. Oh, elephants. You're pushing over all the trees. Making my life difficult. Oh, actually, it's uh, the authority who's making my life difficult by taking me through here. Oh, he's, he's running off to something again. Hold on. I'm going to try to stick with him. I wonder what he's running after. Oh, dear. We're going to get through here. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. We're gonna make it. Oh dear, we might be stuck. No, we're not. Never fear. Oh, he's, 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 he's really running. I can just see him running. Unfortunately, I can't really go quick enough to keep up with him at the moment. Actually, well, let's go into the riverbed where it's going to be easier. Hold on. No, we're not going to fall, don't worry. There we go. The riverbed will give us a better. There he is. He's, he's about to pop open, uh, pop out in the open. And we've got a lovely racetrack to travel down. There he is. What are you jogging after, Mr. Authority? Oh no, don't go up there. <laughs> Oh, he's giving us a proper run around. Okay, so he's going up. We're going to go up as well. Oh. There we 
you go. Watch the thorns there, Jandre. Chandra is scared of thorns. I'm so disappointed in him. Are you okay? So if we lose the authority, it's Jandre's fear of thorns that have done it. Uh, camera, cameraman. In Swahili, we'd say kamakawaida. Same, same. Or same difference. Okay, we've lost sight of him now, but he was heading. You got him? 2.30, okay, awesome. So, we've managed to stick with him. Is he... I'm just... No, no, I'm just trying to decide which way is going to be easier. Let's go this way. Right. Ah, he was chasing a lady friend. That's why he was in such a rush. Now, let's get a bit closer now that we've uh, know he's not going to be jogging on. I wonder which lady friend it is. Is it Amber Eyes? Or is it the youngest in Kahuma? But while we make our way there, let's go have a look what's happening in another part of Juma. We've got our fire going, it's roaring quite nicely. I've managed to get our water on the boil and it's just busy getting the last few steps. Now we don't have any coffee or anything to add to it, unfortunately. We just got some warm water, but warm water is better than cold water on a day like today for sure. And you can see inside there, it's a little bit leafy and full of ash, but you know, a little bit of ash has never killed anybody. Just the fact that there's that steam rising off of the top of it Keeping your hands warm, yes. I'm a very pleased little boy at the moment. I must be honest with you. Quite happy and content in our campsite over here. Got a nice big tree above us. Lots of old stories to tell. Got a place to get out of the wind. Put my head down just now. And when you're busy building a camp like this, it's all, it's all about home improvements. You're never really happy and that's the sort of that's the sort of mindset that you've got to be in. Everything is, can always be tweaked. You can always reposition your camp a little bit better. Make a better chair. We've put a chair out here. Get more firewood. Boil some more water. Make some adjustments to your sleeping mat. Get some rocks. Make them warm. There's always something that you can do. And that's what keeps you busy, basically, and keeps you going through the days. But we, for now, are quite happy. I must be honest. I'm quite happy with what we've managed to accomplish here today. I love the setting. We've got nice open bush all around us. Huge, big old tree to tell us some stories. Yes, we're not too far away from that lion in actual fact. We're probably about, I don't know, about a mile and a half or so from that lion. I hope they don't run over here. I hear that uh, they've been running around and giving you a lot, of, uh, a lot of action over there. It's been nice. I must be honest. It's been quite nice to hear about it. But on that, and while I drink my warm water over here and enjoy my fire, I'm going to send you back over to Brent with those lions. So, he was running after a lady. Just hang on a second, I'm hearing something very strange in front of me. Very strange. Sounds like another lion cub. Somewhere in the thickets ahead of us. But almost not a lion cub. It's a very strange sound. I know with the wind it might be quite difficult for you to hear. It's difficult for me to hear. There we go. She's calling. So maybe it is a lion cub, but it sounds. Maybe it's the missing cub. I can't see. Is this one of the? This is one of the mothers. Now 
unfortunately, we can't actually even get into that area where the sound is coming from. It's, it's a little ravine. So if we have a look here, so the sound's coming from in these little ravines and thickets here. I can't see anything. But the cub sounds quite upset. But mom's not too upset, so she's calling at it, but doesn't look too stressed. I can't see anything there. Can you see anything, Jean? Mm -hmm. I think I'm just gonna. Well, we, we've got these here. I just, I'm really, really curious to see what's going on there. Okay. I'm just gonna go forward where we can see up one of these little ravines. You got it. Oh, here it is, it's right here, it was just below us. It's the missing cub. It's not looking well. Okay, I'm gonna move us into a... It could have been injured. I'm just gonna move forward a little bit. How's that, Chandra, a bit better? Right, let me get a bit closer to the edge. So, I can't see. Outwardly that there's anything wrong just the way it was calling sounds very very strange And we've got a gap through there Forward do it So How's that? Okay. So I mean, outwardly, I can't see any anything wrong. It's lying in, a, in some mud. Now, unless it moves and stands up, walks, if we can see any any obvious injuries. No, it is. It isn't. It is a really tough life being a, a lion. And there's a whole host of ways that if this cub is injured, it, it might have become injured. It could have been hurt by a buffalo. It could have been kicked by a giraffe. A, a cub by itself would even be, could be even hurt by a kudu and a nyala. But obviously this female has run all the way down here looking for it. It's found it, she's calling at it, but it's just lying in the mud going, oh, 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 man. And it was a very strange call. That's, that's, it definitely stood out to me. Not, not sort of the normal cub contact calls. And there is the male and female. Now, on Saturday night, I heard the Inkahumas attempt to hunt a hippo very close to this area. And Michael's wondering, do I think that the cub could have possibly injured, been injured during that? It's very possible, Michael. Uh, I'd actually forgotten about that. That's, that's a very, very good theory you've got there, Michael. But until this cub decides to stand or walk, uh, it's very difficult for us to say whether it's truly injured or it's just been separated. But normally, if a female calling that close, the cub would run in. But it's, it's not, it's just lying on the, on the cool, cold mud. Now you can see the lines have been around here. If you come out a little bit, you can see the lion tracks in the mud next to you, the bigger lion tracks in the mud next to you. The, the lion cub, so it's possible that it, it, it got forgotten or was snoozing when the rest of the pride moved But that that call was 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 very strange and It's looking a little bit skinny, but nothing too Too bad I'm trying to see any outward signs of injury and I I can't
I'm going to try to find it. I think I'm going to try, yes, there's a way. We go to the other side of the male and female where we can get into the little riverbed and we can have a look at the cub from the front. Such a strange call. Past the adults. There we go. There's the female. And there's the authority. You can see how much better that wound is looking. Hello, Mfumo. Go. Let's have a closer look in there. What is that inside there, Jandre? Is it just a bit of dirt? Just a bit of dirt. A bit of a scab. Looking much, much better. There we go. Mfumo, the authority. Now, male lions are always full of cuts, nicks, holes, scratches and the like and they do have quite the time of it defending their territory and also fighting for mating rights with the different females. There we go, there's a fly. Don't lay eggs in there you naughty fly. There's a fly argument happening on this schnoz. Look at those flies. Okay, well you can see, you can see how much that wound has recovered since uh, it opened up and spilt maggots everywhere. Oh, female's calling for the cub again. Let me just move forward. Cub's not even lifting its head. You can just make it out behind her. I'm going to get down into the drainage line so we can have a better look. Tamira says, I don't understand, why is the female not going down to the cub? Well, I t t to be completely honest, Tamira, I, I can't be 100% sure. Uh, sometimes, I, with, oh, now she is, Tamira, there we go. <laughs> She's walking down to the cub now. I'm still calling. Is answering in this very strange little voice. Okay, let's go forward a little bit. Oh, Tamira, the one reason she might not be going straight towards the cub is because of the presence of the male. So uh, he might have amorous intentions, even though she's still lactating. So sometimes. There can be misdirected aggression, so she might be doing it slowly uh, to avoid that conflict with the male, especially with the cub. That just, it's just, I mean, there's nothing outwardly wrong, but there is definitely something wrong. I can't say what it is. Hello, Timberti tree. I'm just going to get it past so Jandre has got. Are we okay? Oops, there's a hole there. There's a hole there. Anyway, that should do. Sorry about the angle, Jandre, but the lioness is quite close. I don't want to go any closer to her. There she is. Let's 
So there we go. There she is. She's moved a bit closer to the cub. The cub is still lying in the exact same position where we first spotted it. Oh, I might have to move because of the... There we go. You can see that. Oh. A little bit of mane showing, but nothing bad on the elbow there. I just, I, w I really wonder whether this cub can move is my question. And it hasn't made any attempt to sit up. And, and again, it could have very easily been injured by another animal or even by uh, another lion. Now, of course, this is quite an interesting scenario, and I can't be certain yet, but as I said, it looks like it might be injured. And Michael is, is wondering, would the lionesses eventually leave it behind if it can't keep up or with the pride or slows the pride down? Uh, they would, Michael. Uh, probably not intentionally, as you can see, those females come back. So we're probably about a kilometer from where the rest of the pride are. And, and she's come back towards here and she's called. The cub's answered, but it's not moving. She looks like she might call again. Now, as, as, as difficult and as sad as this is, it is it is part of nature, and we're not here to interfere, we're here to observe. She's looking back, listening back towards where the rest of the pride are. There you go, she's calling to the cub. Jeffrey, and he's in Texas, says it looks like it may have broken his back. I tend to agree, Jeffrey, but I'm, I'm still leaning towards the side of optimism. Now, I'm just going to warn everyone, it, it doesn't happen very often, but it can happen with an injured cub. The mother will sometimes eat it, so just just be warned and just looking at the behavior. I have seen it before. Um, or the male might eat it. It's, it's, I, it but I, Jeffrey, I, the longer I sit here, I almost have to agree with you that there's some major massive trauma that's causing this cub not to be able to move. Oh shame, it's calling. Now you've got to remember there's nothing we can do in this situation. wrenching but we must remember this is nature the lioness is moving away now the cubs calling forlornly the lioness has moved away I can still hear her calling for the cub and we saw that, that he tried to or she tried to get up but couldn't No, I know. She's she's coming back. No, 
I know this might sound quite terrible, but she's calling. And almost the best thing for this cub would be to be found by a leopard or a hyena or another predator. Or even for mom or the Birmingham and Fumo to eat, to, to kill him themselves. And it's, it could be a very painful death here in the Mawati River otherwise. And I know it's going to be very, very difficult for all of us to, to accept, but we've got to remember that this is nature and well, there's not much we can do about it. There we go, look at her. She's right next to us. It's okay. Oh, I can hear that call. This is, this is really difficult, but there's nothing we can do. There you go, she's moving off. Where's the male? I can't see the male at the moment. Oh, he's lying down over there. Oh, shame, calling as the female moves away. Tried to get up again. Calling, calling, calling for the cup. She's coming back. She's coming back and she's calling. There she comes. She almost just seems to be trying to will the cub to follow her. She keeps leaving and coming back and leaving and coming back. Oh, the cub's trying to get up, Shana. And just try to get up again and again fell down into that position. So you can hear that call. It's different. It's, it's, it's just not the same. Oh, shame. James would like to know, if the cub dies, will it be collected for an autopsy? Well, James, uh, uh, probably not. What normally happens is the, the scavengers, hyenas, or the lions themselves will actually eat what's left of the cub. Here comes mom again calling, she's walking back. It's almost an exasperated call. Come on, come. I know this is very difficult to watch, guys. I, but 
Oh, there we go. And what she's doing is she walks in and walks away, walks to where the cub can see her. Oh, no, shame. Jeez. Oh, no. Oh, this is heartbreaking. I don't know if I can sit here anymore. Oh, jeepers. Just try to get up again. Mom's still calling. Oh, there we go. It's moved back into a position where it's a bit more comfortable. And uh, we, we're going to stay here. We're not going to go anywhere. We're just going to take a moment to sort of regroup. Uh, while we do that, let's go see what Steph's up to on foot. Oh, shame. <laughs> I'm just hearing various news of uh, this being a very, very sad and very emotional time for everyone. And it's just, I suppose, a good time just to regroup and, and collect ourselves and to remember that this is Africa and it's a hard, very, very harsh place to live. And, and you know, these things happen and, and uh, we've got to feel privileged in a way that we can bear witness to these events um, and to celebrate the trials and the tribulations of of this pride and of the members of these prides and it's just a it's a very sombering moment um to 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 be and to be quite honest with you when we remember uh, when you remember that it sort of lends this gray oppressive feeling to everything but you know the the, the good thing is is that is that uh, we can follow the lives of these of these animals and I have no doubt that as time passes along there will be some more celebrations in store for these uh, for these lions and for this for this particular lion pride and um, yeah we look forward to seeing what's next down the road and, and I suppose putting this behind us as quickly as what we can um, we've obviously moved on from from our camp and uh, are making our way back to uh, to quarantine and back to the DRC, which I think is going to be a little bit subdued this morning. Instead of celebrating the end of game drive, I'm sure it's going to be quiet coffees mulling over mortality. Whew. It's quite difficult to actually to, to, to say anything. Um, all I can say, I suppose, is, you know, let it be over quick, I think. <laughs> but we are going to make our way through to, uh, to the quarantine and obviously to the end of drive. I just want to say thank you very much for joining um, myself and Viam and Herbert on the bushwalk for this morning. Uh, you will see us this afternoon uh, for the PM bushwalk and uh, wherever you are in the world I just want to say hope you have a happier day further <laughs> see you soon okie dokie well Dave let's try and find something happy let's find something happy maybe the goose has chicks and goslings actually to be more specific let's stop and have a look at least there's water. <laughs> at least there's water and at least it's rained. But I think a very sad morning for everyone at Safari Live. No goslings. Come on, Egyptian goose. We're your little ones. It would have been really nice just to finish off our morning drive. Very glad that we got to see cheetah, though. And we have left to give other people a chance to see them before they disappear completely. <laughs> you can see how thick the mud is by the way that the goose is sort of lifting up its feet. They really are beautiful birds. We start to take them for granted just because we see them so frequently, but they really are very, very striking birds. And looking at this one now, I actually think it might be quite a young Egyptian goose, which would explain the lack of partner and goslings. Beautiful. Okay, no goslings there. Let's go and find something else happy, Dave. Okay. 
It's really nice to see the amount of water that is around and it was actually particularly pleasant to travel around Cheetah Plains this morning and to see just how much it has rained there. Um, as long as I have been driving around Cheetah Plains it has been far drier than Juma so it's really nice to see that they at least have had a little bit of rain, enough to sustain, enough to make those big open areas nice and green and to fill up the puddles. It's very special to see. Even Juma Dam has water in it after all this time. And Salvatore, welcome. I don't think I've heard your name before, so I think a relatively new viewer, and it's wonderful to have you on board. You wanted to know, because we seem to get out and to wander around a lot, you want to know if we're not scared of any, or nervous of walking around, and if what stops animals from mistaking us as prey. Well, first and foremost, many, many hundreds of thousands of years of evolution have taught the predators instinctively in this area. Just like an antelope knows that a lion is dangerous without having to ever have encountered it before. Just like my little Vimarana puppy, for example, knew that a lion was dangerous without any way of having any prior knowledge of what a lion was. It's the exact same thing with the animals. They know that the human form through evolution and through our history as a species interacting with other animals, they know that we're a hunter. We are an apex predator. And that is one of the big reasons why we are not on something like a lion's menu, except at night. And you'll notice when we get out at night, we are very careful to stay quite close to the vehicle and to always check with our spotlights and so on. And that's because the tables turn completely when night falls and we do become potential prey. But during the day, it's important to remember that there is nothing out here that wants to harm us. There's nothing here that bears us any malice or any ill will. It's simply the, the, the rare cases where human beings are attacked by wild animals is a case where that animal is scared, it's afraid, it's trying to protect itself and it responds in kind. It, it has very little to do with any kind of wanting to attack us. They don't seek us out. Well, that's not true. Animals do occasionally seek out humans, but only to, to get an idea of what we're doing and if we're a threat, out of curiosity sometimes. So elephants, for example, will follow the scent of a human being. Uh, rhino often circle around and try and get downwind of you to try and smell what you are. But absolutely, no, I, I don't get nervous. I'm far more nervous in a city than I am walking around in the bush. That's that. You know, having said that, I wouldn't advise somebody who doesn't know what they're doing in the wild to go and walk through the African bush. That is not safe. We spent many, we've spent many, many years training, many years on foot, getting to know the individual animals and learning to read their behavior and learning. And it's a very, it, it cannot be underestimated as a skill. And it's something that Steph is amazing at, is being able to walk and have that spatial awareness to know what's going on all around you and to be so in, sort of alert and intent and observant that you're aware of an animal before you become a threat to it. Well, on that note, we're going to start heading home for breakfast. I think it's time for us all to say goodbye. So from myself and Dave, and big thank you to Dave, by the way, for his wonderful camera work. Uh, and a big thank you to all of you. We're going to say goodbye for now and we'll see you on the sunset safari. Bye-bye, everybody. We just, we just witnessed possibly one of the saddest things I've seen in a very long time in the African bush. A female came back, tried to move the cub with its, with its nose and with its, its paws, and the cub almost just sort of hissed at her. It, it's very seriously injured, and uh, unfortunately, this is life out here in the African bush, and lion cubs die. It's just not often you, you, you end up in a position like this where you see them before. And I know a lot of you might disagree, but I think the best thing would be if a hyena or something happen to, to come across and, and, and just end this, this cub's life a little bit faster. It's just very, very sad, but this is, this is the wild, I and mean, we, we, we can't put our, our human norms and our human morality to, to a perfect system, nature. 
and it's it's just one of those very very sad things and we will come back and keep checking on this and just a reminder to all that there's there's no sunset safari this evening um, we are doing rehearsals but um, we will we will keep you posted on, on on what's happening with this beloved in Kahuma Cub and I know it's gonna be very difficult for, for, for everyone, us included. I mean, I'm, I'm distraught, uh, but I've got to remember, this is, this is nature, this is what happens. And just because we're here seeing it doesn't make it any more different or special. But from all of us here at Safari Live, I'll see you tomorrow.